Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to say that Senator Wasserberger is in a similar situation with school starting and uh, we'll be checking in a little bit later this morning. Okay, very good. Leanne, are you taking roll or is Karen? Karen will be calling the roll this morning. All right. Miss Karen, if you want to go ahead and call the roll and get us live and do whatever else we need to to get started. Absolutely. You are live on YouTube, so we'll go ahead and call the roll. Representative Freeman. He is here. Here. He said Senate, uh, Representative Harshman would be here shortly. All right. He's excused at this time, but we'll be in and out, yes. Thank you. Representative Larson. Here. Representative Summers. Here. Senator Bebel. Here. Senator Cost. Here. Senator Rothfuss. Here. Senator Wasserberger, I assume is excused as well? Correct. Coach, pardon me, Vice Chairman Landon. Uh, here. Chairman Walters. Here, thank you. You have a quorum. Very good. Uh, moving on to our next item on the agenda, and that is the approval of the minutes from our June meeting. Uh, those were sent out several a month ago, probably via emails. Uh, hopefully everyone had a chance to take a look at those. Were there so, any addition, additions or corrections? So moved the minutes. Moved by Summers. Is there a second? Second by Freeman. Any additions, corrections? Hearing none, seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye or raising your hands in the camera rather. Okay, it looks like that's unanimous. The minutes will pass to, as circulated. Uh, moving on to item number three on our agenda, state construction department updates. And uh, I think this also includes committee responses or responses to committee questions from our previous meeting. And so with that, I think I'll start with uh, Director Muldrow uh, to get things rolling. And then we have various members of uh, school facilities, state construction school facilities. And um, Director Muldrow, if it's all right with you, uh, the committee members will ask questions as we go, as they come up. Is that okay with you? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, sir, that'll be fine. All right, very good. So committee, is, uh, if you have questions, it's, as these folks are presenting, just uh, raise your hand and Senator Landon and I'll do our best to keep an eye on the screen and see who has their hands raised. So with that, Director Muldrow, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Walters, uh, Chairman Landon, committee members. Uh, SCD, as you know, will be presenting two robust packages today uh, on school facility side. As you as you mentioned, it'll be two responses to the committee's requests and the SFC's annual report. Uh, before we move on for that, though, I wanted to just take a minute for those who may not be aware uh, Mr. Brandon Finney, our SF division administrator, has left the department. He's taken a position at Sheridan Two School District as their new business manager. He is here today uh, to uh, support uh, the department in case there are some uh, questions or comments uh, that maybe we can't uh, respond to. Uh, he'll be available for that. So with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll turn it back to you. Senator Landon. Mr. Chairman, I see a, a D. McComey on the screen. I wonder who that was. Uh, we'll let anyone into these meetings, apparently. All right, Director Muldrow, do you have anything further? Or are you going to turn it over to uh, Paul and, and Troy to continue with this presentation? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. The first up would be uh, Paul Severson, our Design and Construction Administrator. Uh, he will start with the... Um, request on the financial capital construction funded by the state of Hawaii. He will brief on that. And so committee members, this is uh, request number one in your, your documents that were mailed out and would also be in the meeting materials online. And it's titled, titled tab request number one, or request one, excuse me. So go ahead, Paul. If you're ready. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Paul, again, uh, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, Paul, the committee will pro might interrupt you as you go to ask questions while they're fresh on our minds. Uh, hopefully that's okay with you, but we'll try and keep it flowing along nonetheless. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've provided um, a wide variety of information for um, for the uh, the committee uh, in, in association with how Hawaii is dealing with their capital improvement program. Uh, Mr. Chairman, rather than going through point by point, uh, there's there's a lot of information that was uh, that was brought forward. Uh, the state of Hawaii is pretty good about providing uh, public facing information uh, in regard to the work uh, that they're doing, their funding. So I, I've collected that information together and I put it together in the package for, uh, for the committee to review. Uh, some baseline facts that I will uh, kind of give that uh, prefaces a lot of this information. Uh, the state of Hawaii has about 185,000 enrollment uh, in their education programs, K through 12. Uh, in comparison, Wyoming's about 90,000. So we're, we're approximately 50% of the size of, uh, of Hawaii. Um, Hawaii has 283 um, education buildings. Um, in some of the information uh, that I've presented, they, they also state the number 256 in a few places. I'm not positive which one is correct, um, but it's somewhere in the mid 200 range uh, for the total number of facilities that they have. Uh, comparatively, Wyoming, we have 475 active education buildings right now. Uh, and with active and inactive, we have about 911 facilities right now. Um, the average age of buildings uh, in the uh, Hawaii education program is 72 years old, and they have uh, 52 that are over 100 years old. Um, both Hawaii and Wyoming have some issues associated with, uh, with re remoteness. Um, Hawaii's uh, remoteness is due to being uh, separated on individual islands. Uh, Wyoming is due to the large area with a relatively uh, sparsely populated area. Um, uh, in comparison, Hawaii has a single school district. Uh, that single school district, uh, it has seven divisional offices. Those offices are placed on the primary populated islands in Hawaii, uh, but all of their decision-making is done from a single school district. Uh, comparatively, um, Wyoming has 48 school districts. Um, Hawaii's funding mechanism for their capital improvement program uh, is bonding. Uh, in the information that they have available, they do have three uh, types of bonds that are available to them. I was only able to find that they were using one. They're a general obligation bond. Uh, their state constitution does limit the amount of total indebtedness that uh, they are allowed to, to have in that program. Um, their funding is all categorical uh, for education. Uh, a couple of the uh, acronyms that you will notice in the information that is given to you, uh, CIP, which refers to their capital improvement program, which is what the question uh, directly was related to. Uh, you will also see in there some of the reference information also has uh, EDN, which is Education Department Non-General Fund. So they categorically uh, fund when they fund education in the state of Hawaii. Uh, they currently have uh, a facilities division within their school district that, that operates uh, all of their facilities. However, they are currently in the process of changing uh, to a state agency similar to what we have. Uh, that state agency then would become uh, an executive branch agency uh, that would operate under the government and respond to the school board and the legislature. Uh, currently, they are in the formative stages and have not completely stood up that, uh, that agency yet. Uh, but it would appear in the next few years that that agency will be taking over the responsibility of facilities on Hawaii. Uh, their funding request system, it, as you look at the information that uh, is available to you, you will see that uh, uh, 
they bring forward requests that come from individual facilities that go to their school district. They post those requests, make those requests to the legislature. And uh, in the examples that you will see there, the, uh, uh, the actual funding that the legislature does in many cases is quite divergent from the requests. Uh, in the uh, most recent uh, legislative uh, appropriation, uh, they had a request of $719 million, of which they funded $203 million. Uh, so their legislature does make independent decisions regarding which of the projects that they have forward uh, that they are going to fund. Um, and included um, in, in the package, uh, I, I provided a sample bill uh, for a capital funding project. Um, you will notice in the numbers that are in that sample bill that many of the, uh, uh, the numbers are, are essentially club numbers. Uh, for example, they have design at $1,000, printing plans at $1,000, but it's a $19 million uh, appropriation. So um, what, what, they, what they do is they identify the total amount of funds that are, avail uh, that, that are uh, appropriated for the project. And then the, uh, currently the school district division makes the decision on how to implement those funds to, to achieve the, uh, the capital improvement that they've requested. Uh, I have noticed that, that they do follow up. Uh, if their funding is short, they do not uh, provide additional unanticipated funds. Uh, they do have to come back following years uh, to uh, receive additional funds if, if they do fall short of funds. Uh, also in the information, you will see there's a, there's a lot of categorical information. They do a lot of analysis on their building conditions, just as we do in Wyoming. And then they, uh, they make requests specifically on individual uh, known uh, condition needs. And those, uh, those condition needs then are determined by the legislature, which of those will be uh, funded and final. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Representative Summers, go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and I, you know, this was my request and I got probably more than I ever expected to get, but I do think it's an in interesting uh, analogy between our two places just simply because you know, they're one district and in, in essence in funding CAPCON, we're one district. The, the one question I have, and, and maybe you'll get to it is, on their major maintenance, do, how do they fund? I, I, I mean, I, I understand how they fund. It's a legislative decision and you can see where they've funded it less than the recommendations. Um, but how, how do they determine that major maintenance piece there? Do they do a percentage of, of square footage or how do they determine major maintenance? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, un unlike uh, the block of major maintenance funding that we do, uh, the listing that I provided, uh, which you will see, it's got the, uh, the blue and the green colors associated with it. The legislature funds individual major maintenance projects um, in, in their legislative bills. So they are funded for specific major maintenance needs on an annual basis. So they, they do not receive uh, funds in particular for the major maintenance piece uh, in, in any way except for an individual request for that individual uh, major maintenance uh, need or remedy. So Mr. Chairman, so it's funded more like our, just a quick follow-up, it's funded more like our, our component level funding as opposed to a block grant to the districts. Would that be more accurate? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, that would be more accurate uh, in regard to how, how the funding is actually distributed uh, within between facilities. Um, in, in addition, Mr. Chairman, um, the information does identify that they do have some, some smaller individual project uh, funding mechanisms. Uh, one of them are grants of $50,000 or less, which are uh, uh, awarded on a facility by facility basis. 
Uh, they do also have some uh, programs, uh, for example, uh, air conditioning, uh, where the, the state will share costs with individual schools uh, for providing window air conditioners. It does not appear that they do central air conditioning in their facilities. Um, and that is done on a, uh, an indi individual facility basis, um, but the individual facilities do have to share in the costs of, of those improvements as well. Um, they also have a, a couple of future looking uh, funding mechanisms, uh, some 21st century school uh, funding, um, also uh, another program that they call 3R, uh, which you'd have to read the descriptions. There's a description for each of, of the R's. And those are uh, smaller individual facility-based funding opportunities. But many of those require uh, the facility itself to do some local fundraising to match funds on those if they want those improvements. Uh, the improvements that are funded directly by the state are the ones that are determined by their condition assessments. Um, Mr. Chairman, un unless there's uh, additional questions, um, I did not intend on, on getting any deeper in particular in the information because there is a lot of information here uh, that can be gleaned out. Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Paul, when you mentioned that they bond for their major maintenance, I think you said they were general obligation bonds. Was the responsibility for their bonds back to the state or to the individual district? It, it, uh, it is a state obligation bond, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and their constitution does limit uh, the total indebtedness that, that they are allowed to do with those general, general obligation bonds. Uh, the information that they do provide on their capital programs does indicate that there are two other bonding uh, mechanisms of which I, I couldn't find specific information because it appears that the general bonding is their preferred and their typical approach to funding capital projects. Thanks, Paul. Representative Freeman. Um, I have a couple questions. One is, is their buildings are so old, do they spend more on major maintenance or maintenance in general to, to, up, to keep the, the, um, uh, the buildings up to date? Um, I've been to Hawaii about, about six times and the, the elements are very um, destructive of, of structures. So that, kind of um, interests me. The other thing is, is uh, when you were talking about the remoteness, remoteness isn't about 80% of all the of Hawaii's population is on Oahu and then the other 20s on the other islands. Um, and, um, and then just an observation, I bicycled around the big island and we did this right after June, and there was a lot of parents that were painting buildings and that kind of stuff. Was that incorporated into their maintenance program, or did you hear anything about that at all? Thank you. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, they, they do seem to rely a little more heavily on local involvement with, with their schools in particular, uh, and follow up to your question. Uh, there does seem to be a, a relatively high level of uh, participation by locals in maintaining their buildings, but uh, there is, um, is not in anything that would suggest uh, in their funding model that they are uh, funding um, more per building than what the state of Wyoming is. Um, didn't do a specific analysis on, on the, uh, the major maintenance piece, uh, but it does look like they, they make commitments to their buildings long-term uh, and their replacement program is relatively small. Representative Freeman reading on page three of 78 of this document, it talks about the Hawaii 3R program and it's for projects small in scope to improve school campuses matching donor funds in the amount of grants limited to $50,000 to schools who produce matching private contributions 
or professional volunteerism, sweat equity, basically. And so I think when you saw them painting, that's what I would guess the, the state bought the paint and the people went and applied it and called it a, a matching contribution or the, the parents went and applied it. And so that appears to be one of their mechanisms. Uh, Mr. Chairman, again, I was a school teacher and, and bicycling around. There was a lot of donations for uh, specific things like air conditioning was, was one of the things that I remember, but it, it just seemed so different than Wyoming when I was going through. But it, sure. it was very, very interesting. Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and Paul or Mel or who, whoever might want to answer this question. I think on the major maintenance thing, it brings up an interesting question to me. And, and that is, have, has your department ever analyzed, you know, whether there would be efficiencies in doing major maintenance completely like we do component level funding? In other words, instead of funding a block grant down to districts, to do major maintenance actually, uh, you know, and major maintenance projects have to be approved through your office. And I realize all that. Is there, uh, is there any efficiencies to be had by doing all major maintenance except maybe small, very small things through component level? And, and have, has that ever been analyzed? Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh... We, we internally have had discussions in regard to the major maintenance funding mechanism. Uh, not, not to the point though, that I, I believe I could give you any conclusive in, information that we've ever determined. Um, we, what we do observe though, is when districts make their requests for major maintenance, uh, uh, in some instances, the, the initial requests um, it, it, it's, it's obvious when you see the request, it, it'll be an even dollar amount, it'll be $250,000. So they've, they've thrown a number at it. And we, we don't see the final costs on those particular um, requests until their 680 report is filed by uh, the end of June each year. Um, in some cases, we'll find that the number was, was wildly larger than uh, what, what they had requested, and sometimes it was much smaller. Um, it, it would appear that they're planning as they do projects, um, that they know that they have larger sums of money that they can uh, rely on. And so their, their preparations at the point when they make the request to us um, appear to be probably less well developed than when they actually uh, get to uh, completing the work. Um, so the only observation we've made is that uh, uh, we believe that perhaps their internal planning of which, again, we, we, don't, uh, we don't see that um, uh, is, is something that we, we really can't respond to because we, we don't really see it. Uh, Vice Chairman Landon, and then I'll get to you, Senator Bebout. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Paul, I was intrigued by the Act 155 reference that you included in your report um, and the ability for the public to lease public school lands for public purposes. I'm wondering, uh, did you drill down at all on that or have any conversations with them on that? And how would it differ from what we're doing here in Wyoming with respect to grazing leases or whatever it might be? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my, my focus was in particular on, on capital uh, funding and the mechanism they were using uh, for capital funding. And I, I did not specifically drill down on that provision. It, it is obviously one of those things that is quite noticeable in, in the information that they do make available in regard to their facilities, but I, I did not specifically drill down on that information. Well, thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the intriguing part of that is that they might be doing something with their state lands that, that we're not aware of or that that uh, we have not considered. And so uh, appreciate that, Paul. Thanks. Senator Bebout. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And and well done on this this request, Paul. The uh, It's hard to, to really get a lot of information because it's such a snapshot, but 
you know, when you look at the, uh, although this doesn't deal with capital construction, you have 185,000 students, 13,000 teachers, Wyoming, 90,000, 6,500 teachers. So those numbers seem to, to sort of equate and be similar. Uh, but when you get back to capital construction, it's really interesting, you know, when they, the requests are so high and they run through and they just really, uh, they really take a hard look at and really have some serious reductions. The one thing I looked at was instructional and, and other areas. I didn't see the word suitability anywhere. Uh, is that something that they consider or is it just, it's just not there and, and they deal with it in another way and, and the capacity, obviously they've had enough schools built in the past that they don't need to worry about it. That's why that's at zero, but on the suitability, I never saw it anywhere. Is it their fault or do, is it just something that they bury in all these other categories? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in, in response to that question, the uh, uh, they have identified in particular, the closest thing I found uh, referring to suitability is their 21st century schools initiative. But um, they, they are implementing that in a period of time of which currently they aren't addressing it. it. It's one of those, I believe that the program starts in 2024 of implementation. So I believe they're still in the development of how they intend on addressing that. Uh, but I do not believe it is an active program right now from, from what I was able to de determine. And much of, much of their current statute and legislation is, is forward looking and many of the programs that are identified within their statutes are not actually being implemented at this time. Uh, they are preparing to implement them uh, at, a, at a relatively near future date. And Mr. Chairman, one quick uh, bonding side, uh, Representative Larson brought it up, but it's the full faith and credit of Hawaii is obviously behind those bonds. And so when they do their budgets, they just have an allocation of whatever those bond costs per year over the life of it and factor that in their budgets, just like we would if we were in debt and did bonding. Is that accurate? Mr. Chairman, that, that's uh, my observations from the information that I reviewed. Senator, we about reading this, it appears that they're not allowed to exceed 18 and a half percent of their general fund budget in total indebtedness. That's what I gather from this document. And so that's, that's one way they try and keep it under control, apparently. As you said, it's a snapshot, but that's what I was able to get out of it. Further questions about how the state of Hawaii handles their capital construction and major maintenance yeah, Mr. Chairman, just to bring the point up, I wonder, is that constitutional or statutorily required or just a rule? The way I read it, it's constitutional. As I said, I haven't done a full legal analysis of it, but that's what I read in this document. It's a constitutional requirement. Further questions about the state of Hawaii? I think it's a great comparison as uh, one of, the, I think as Representative Summers pointed out for capital construction, Wyoming and Hawaii are very similar because we treat it like one school district. Uh, so I think it is a, a good comparator and Senator Bebow pointed out that, that we're pretty much in line with what Hawaii is doing. Uh, so I guess we'll continue and proceed and uh, there's no further questions on that request about how Hawaii works. We'll move on to request number two. So request number two, again, this is a follow-up uh, from our previous meeting. And uh, I see Laura, you've came on the screen. You must be presenting this item. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, right. this, this was a request from our last meeting in, in June where Senator Rothfuss asked us to provide an explanation as to why the square footage was so high for the John C. Schiffer Alternative School. So in 2015, Sheridan II began a most cost-effective remedy or Mercer study to address the needs of the district. And they had a facility that was sized for 156 students and would house both the alternative junior high and the alternative high school students in one facility with a calculated maximum square footage size of 31,200 square feet and an estimated cost of over $10.4 million. In 2017, the evolution of that Mercer study continued and it was determined that the junior high alternative school could be moved to 
an, a different building, the early building, in order to reduce the size of the allowable students and the square footage. So that reduced the capacity to 116 students and an allowable square footage to 23,780 square feet. Then it was recommended also that the, share, that the building be located on Sheridan College campus to provide educational opportunities for the student. And it was designed to have similar attributes as the other campus buildings, so it kind of fit in with the campus. The district did follow all the design requirements, including the value engineering per statute. In July of 19, the district let the bid and it received four bids as seen in the chart on the, on the second page of the report. The range was from 9,299,000 to 10,562,000 with a spread of 1,263,000. The low bid was $422.18 per square foot. At that point, the district, the SCD staff and the architect determined that it was excessive and they reevaluated the project. So they began to review all the design and see what they could modify while not impacting the delivery of the educational program. So working with the architect's educational specialist, they reduced another 2,176 square feet, taking it down to 19,850. They reviewed and modified all the building systems where applicable, including interior and exterior finishes, mechanical plumbing, all of those sorts of things. And then strategically let the bid out in December of 2019 to get better pricing. So the second time there were six bids ranging from 7,980,000 to 8,999,000. The spread was between the low and the high was about a million 19,000 and the low bid came in at $402 and two cents per square foot. And with that, have they started construction, broke ground? As I understand it, they have started construction. Okay, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Anderson, thank you for the follow-up and, and the detailed response. I appreciate the information. Um, I, I am a, a little bit curious, you know, I've, I've been looking at these numbers for a lot of years and $402 per square foot, uh, which is the lowest bid here. I don't know which one was selected and I'm not always for the lowest bid. So I'm not worried if, if that wasn't the selection, but, uh, there's a lot that goes into that. Uh, still, when I look at that range, it looks especially high. And, and I'm curious if there are unique factors that have led to it being on the order of a $400 per square foot where, you know, and again, I don't have the, that we've got the chart here somewhere. I don't have it in front of me uh, to look at the range of, of recent build bids and, and uh, average dollars per square footage for other other buildings, but uh, why are we in the 400s for this particular building? Is there something unique about it that, that leads to that requirement? That's my first question. I, I would say, as I understand it, not having been here when the project was developed, uh, but as I understand it, part of the, the issue was they wanted that building to kind of fit in with the campus on Sheridan, on Sheridan College. And so in order to make it aesthetically and um, cohesive with the rest of the campus, there were certain design elements that were taken into consideration, like various angles that were built at a different, you know, not necessarily square angles, different angles and things, which increases the cost of construction. I will say that I've gone back through and researched, and it looks like in, you know, 2015, 16, 17, we were running somewhere more in the neighborhood of, you know, 250 to $300 per square foot. So this is somewhat of an anomaly. I agree with you on that. And on that question about the exterior, um, there is no bigger advocate for beauty and, and uh, high quality exteriors and ensuring that if we're putting a building on a campus that it's, it's appropriate for that campus for the long term. So you'll, you'll get no objection to that from me. But when we built our high school, uh, one of the things that was included in our enhancement where we spent over $25 million on that enhancement uh, was exterior design considerations to improve the quality of the facade in the building. So I, I guess I'm curious if, if we are getting to that. And again, Laramie High School didn't come anywhere near $400 per square foot, but it's a, it's a beautiful building because the, the taxpayers uh, were willing to add some beauty. Um, why in this instance was that not a consideration that required uh, 
some some local match or or some support from the college or the community uh, to achieve that higher level standard as we saw here when value engineering would have taken out any any of the beauty that we had for the high school. Um, Senator Rothfuss, with that, for that question, I'm going to actually refer to Paul Severson. As I was not here at that time, I can't okay. speak to that. And he, as an architect and a project manager, I think would be better suited to answer your specific question. Great. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the scale of this project is, is relatively small in comparison to some of, some of the projects that we've done. And um, quite often on projects when we have uh, some of the costs that aren't directly related to the, the building itself, the costs still get reflected within the building. Um, for example, on this project, there were two roads that needed to be paved uh, on either side of this facility to, to continue the, the, the campus transportation. And those costs were borne uh, by the state to, to pave those two roads. And so with, with the smaller square footage associated with, with the facility, uh, the modest size, the cost of those roads then does get reflected in a square footage cost, but it does not necessarily mean that those funds were put into the building itself. And, and that, that is an example of part of the reason when, when we're doing a smaller facility like this, uh, which does meet the criteria for high school, some of the costs can look higher and it's not necessarily all in the building. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to follow up on that. That, that makes a lot follow of up. sense. Did we share any of those costs with the college or, or were all of the uh, costs associated with paving uh, borne by the state with this project? Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Uh, in, in this case, uh, since the direction that this was constructed from campus is, is essentially there is not a master plan beyond this at this point, other than the fact that the roadways are extended so that there could be future development uh, in this case, um, there, there was no particular use uh, to be shared with. And so the costs were borne on this one uh, by uh, funding that came through the state construction department and was not shared with the uh, with the campus itself. Thank you, Mr. Severson. And Mr. Chairman, if I may ask one other line of questions briefly. Go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with regard to the student capacity, which I believe we're at 116 was the, the last calculation that I see here, unless I missed something below. Um, was that anticipating the cooperative engagement of two districts, uh, which I know was the original expectation. And, and if so, is that still what we expect to actually be realized? Or I, I seem to recall there was some discussion where one of the two districts that wanted to engage uh, was potentially pulling out of that agreement. Uh, so I, I wanted to know if there was a little follow up, are we going to use the 116 capacity in the near term? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I can respond to that. Go ahead. Uh, initially, there were um, discussions of two additional districts, another one of the Sheridan yes. County districts uh, being associated and Johnson County as well. Uh, in, in the final uh, preparation for this project, it, it was isolated down to the needs of, of the single county uh, or the single district of Sheridan too. Uh, so ultimately, it, it did not include the uh, capacity needs of the other two districts that were in the initial discussions. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Stevenson, so this is right-sized for the one district then based on our projections is, is what I understand then. Go Mr. ahead, Paul. Mr. Chairman, that is correct. These, the, this, this one specifically identifies the needs of uh, Sheridan County too. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Severson and Ms. Anderson. Further questions on the presentation on the John C. Schiffer School. Ms. Anderson or, or Paul, do you know when the expected opening date is for that building? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have been out and uh, observed uh, this facility. It's, uh, it's, it's been several weeks now, uh, but the uh, 
uh, it would not be uh, ready for occupancy for the next year. I believe it, it would be at the, the half year break next year that I believe that it would be fully available for use. So Christmas time of 2021, opening date Correct. you're anticipating. Correct. Um, I, I, there's, there's always the possibility that the contractor could could work on this very expediently, but um, from my observations, it did not look like it was on track for that. Very good. And to your knowledge, is it on budget? Um, I, uh, we, we have uh, seen a few change orders on this project that have come through, Mr. Chairman. Um, and so far, those change orders are, are, are stall, still all within budget, all within the uh, allowable contingency. Uh, we've been working directly with the district in regard to the available funds on this, uh, and they have assured us that they, uh, they intend on staying within the budget. Very good. All right, any further questions? Vice Chairman Landon. Chairman, I was just going to say, I, I know somebody uh, that this committee is pretty familiar with that might be able to keep a pretty close eye on uh, that project now for us. We're hoping that individual will do just that. Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And <clears throat> Paul, this is just a general question. And I know we have a contingency pot of money and, and there's often money left over in contingency, which is good. Um, how do we ensure that if there's change orders that districts are not slopping into contingency on change? How do we know that we're, we're not using contingencies to, to, I guess, perfect change orders that may or may not be necessary? And, and so could you talk about the relationship of our contingency fund with change orders and how we monitor, uh, monitor that? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I can respond to that. Um, uh, when, when we provide the budgets for these projects, our, our contingency is specifically identified as a construction contingency. And our approach to a construction contingency uh, is, is relating to technical issues of the building being fully operational. Um, we, we also do often get requests of what we would consider uh, scope of work change. Uh, adding something that was not part of the original design. Um, uh, and th there, there are considerations of those if, if sufficient funds uh, exist that we do sometimes consider those if, if they have a justification for the educational program. Um, but we, we primarily limit the construction contingency to technical issues. So that when that building is operational, it is, uh, completely technically fully operational. Follow up Representative Summers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and Paul, maybe just give back to me, you know, how I'm, I'm curious of how much of our contingency funding is eaten up by um, change orders. And so if you had a percentage or something at some point, just send it to me in an email. I'm, I'm just curious if, if that constitutes a very minor portion of our contingency a change order or it's a, if it's a major componency of the use of the contingency. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in, in the past we have, uh, we have provided this information. We can update that information and provide it again. It, uh, it is a, a, a bit of a, a deep dive back into uh, into the information of the financing on projects, but uh, we, we can do that. Thank you very much. Further questions? Representative Larson, then I'll get to you, Senator Cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Mel, maybe you could help me on this, uh, but I thought you kind of had a, a, oh, not an exact standard amount, but it sticks in my mind that it's like 6% of the project or is it 2% that you you kind of anticipate would be a contingency amount? What, what is that amount? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson, it tends to, we've got a, a fairly basic amount. It's usually, like you said, around 5 or 6% is what we put in for contingency. And it depends. I know on the, on the state construction management side, 
we use that as pretty much a standard for us. I think on the school side, I'm not sure exactly, Paul, if that differs. Uh, Paul, go ahead. If, if I may, um, uh, in our standarding, standard budgeting procedures for new construction, we do use a 5% number for contingency. Uh, when we are dealing with projects that, uh, that are um, re uh, renovations or, or rehabilitation of existing buildings, uh, we do have two other potential contingencies that we would include. Uh, we would have another 5% uh, that we would add on to that due to unknown conditions in the existing building. And in addition, if there is a need for abatement, we do have uh, an abatement contingency as well. So it depends on um, the actual complexion of the project uh, as to what exactly the contingency would be for that specific project. Uh, we would tie it directly to the type and scope of work for that project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't know, my question might be out of order, but I'm wondering if there isn't a, especially with the uh, economic situation we're in now, a reasonable set of sideboards that could be put on the cost per square feet because um, that seems extremely extremely excessive and I I just think in some ways we got to look at how can we keep that under control a little more. Director Muldrow or Paul do you have any thoughts on that? Um, Mr. Chairman I, I can't address that. Um, as uh, as an architect uh, registered in jurisdictions outside of, uh, of Wyoming, and I have done a number of schools myself, uh, it, it is absolutely true that um, projects can be tailored to their budgets. Uh, we have developed in Wyoming uh, relatively high expectation of the outcome on projects, and that, uh, that expectation has kind of driven uh, where our budgets are. Uh, but absolutely, um, budget limits could be set and, and enforced and, and are fully possible. Uh, it, it's just um, whether or not we have the, uh, um, uh, the will to essentially impose that. We, we haven't uh, directly imposed that because, again, we've, we've developed uh, an expectation of excellence in the state of Wyoming. Director Muldrow? Mr. Chairman, just to follow up with what Paul just said, uh, if you look at um, as a as a holistic conversation at State Construction Department, well, we do the same thing. Understanding the school districts have have a little bit different, but if you take an example, if, when we do community colleges, when we do state buildings, it's the same thing. To Paul's point, we surely can build to the budget, and so as you know, when we get appropriations we fund and we design our projects to that dollar amount that we've asked for. We can't go past it. Uh, if we do go outside of that box, as you know, we have to come back and ask for more money uh, in the next uh, appropriation session. So it's, 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 it's not easy, but we really can sit down like we do at community colleges. And if we see where the budget's too high, we sit down and push that budget back. If that means they have to lose square footage, if they have to uh, downsize uh, a program or something, they're required to do that in order to make that project work. And as you know, like with community colleges, it's a matching fund. So they've got stake in the game and usually they're willing to do that. So I think to Paul's point, if there's a will to maybe um, to look at that on the, on the school side, uh, that's, uh, that's the issue. That's the issue whether you can sort of make that happen. Senator Cost, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, you know, uh, with our current economic thing, its status, I'm not sure that we can afford to say we want to be the prettiest or the best as far as that goes. I think we've got to be reasonable as we work our way through. Uh, some of the things that concern me are, do all of our school districts need to have a middle school track and field and a high school track and field, or can't they use the same one for both? There's just some things that are to me a little excessive that we need to maybe look at tightening up a little bit and saying how can we 
put some parameters or sideboards on these things so that we can control that budget a little better. Um, it's just a thought I'm throwing out there for people to think about for a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I just, I think this conversation is, is really interesting. And, and, uh, and just Paul, remind me how we get to the dollar figure on a project when it's, when we budget for it. And then is there a way that the department, for example, could provide options to the legislature, right? Or, or, or how do we value engineer? Could we do a an upfront value engineer project versus so just remind me how we get to the dollar value that's in the that's in the budget. Paul, um, Mr. Chairman, um, we uh, currently well in, in in the time and my my experience here is is eight years. Uh, in in the time that I have been here, we use a straight line appreciation model uh, for determining our budgets for the future. So uh, due to time, we increase the budget um, on, a, on a straight line appreciation level. And that's how we've been setting our budgets um, to this point in time. Uh, so we, we identify the amount of resource uh, available for a new project, basically based on what we made available in the past. Um, could, could we make a change to that approach? Absolutely, we could make a change to that. Uh, it, it would be uh, a quite market change, especially for our design community to uh, embrace the fact that they may not have the level of resource that they've had in the past. Um, I, I do believe we would probably have some uh, pushback from them, but it does not mean that it could not be achieved. Representative Summers, adding on to that, there's also in the design guidelines, there is the uh, 40 square feet per student in K through three, I believe it is, 50 square feet per student uh, above that. And then there's the 16 to one guidelines uh, and things like that, that all, and so they take a total capacity of the school and, and then age it out for the number of kids in each grade and design it, and that's how they start to create those square footages for the total school, including common space. Uh, and, and maybe Paul or Laura can can give us a little bit more detail, but that's just a synopsis of it as they create that, and then they do what Paul's saying to do, to uh, put the dollars to, to that. Go ahead, Representative Summers. Um, yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and and uh, and yeah, and thanks for the reminder. I, d I did know we had square footages and statute and maybe some of it's even in the rule, I'm not sure. But certainly in this time, you know, um, for those that are designing new buildings, there's the option of no building or the option of a reduced price building. And, uh, and obviously we do not want to build structures that are, that, that don't work, right? That just simply are, are too low cost. Um, if we're going to spend the money, but um, I certainly would be interested in how we can be more efficient with our money and, uh, and how we can drive down those costs. You know, you do go to other states and you look at school buildings, and, and I'm proud of what we've done in Wyoming, but the fact of the matter is, for a while anyway, we're going to have to dial back and use our money smarter. And, and so I think, and this is one area that you hear consistently out in the public, I can't believe that that school looks, you know, that we're spending that much money on a school. So I, I do think it's an area where we have to find some efficiencies if we can. Senator Bevout. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our question, Paul, on, and when you look at the Schiffer School, did the 5% preference come into play at all? in terms of who the successful old bidder was. And, and another thing along that same line is you know, when we look at the, the, the builders in our state that could handle these larger projects, you know, years ago we had way more than we have today. If we were to look at, if the legislature chose to look at that preference to maybe take it up to seven and a half or something to ensure that we really help Wyoming 
companies, Wyoming workers, would that have a negative effect based on your knowledge in school capital construction for our schools? Seems to me that we ought to make every effort we can to employ Wyoming people and Wyoming companies. Somehow, somehow I think we've lost that along the way. Any thoughts in that regard? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in, in response, um, the Shipper School in particular, uh, we, we did have primarily uh, resident contractors who were uh, bidding on that project. Uh, I, I'm, I'm recalling from memory, we may have had one that came uh, from north of the border, uh, but the 5% did not play into that. Um, the contractor is, uh, is a Wyoming resident contractor on that project. Um, there was a period of time um, between 20, 2011 and 2015 when we had um, the number of projects on the street, just it, it outran our capacity of contractors in, in the state of Wyoming. At that period in time, we, we did actually see a lot of contractors coming from south of our border who were doing a lot of our projects. Um, that has changed in recent years. We are not seeing that same kind of uh, uh, influx of out-of-state contractors that we, we had seen at that point in time. But again, we, we created a bit of a demand ourselves by the amount and the scale of construction that we were doing at that point in time. Um, I will also note that uh, south of the border right now, they are just busy on their own. There is a lot of work within the borders of the state just directly to the south of us. Um, they're currently not looking to, to come north to do work, um, is what our observations have been. Um, also, in, in particular, in a, a specific uh, piece of this, um, we saw a period of time when uh, supply of, uh, of our furnishings, for example, was, was coming almost exclusively from outside of our borders. And uh, we, we've seen a, a real change in that as well. Uh, we've changed our bidding procedures. And, uh, we're, we're seeing a, a very good um, portion of that work is now uh, coming from vendors within our borders as well. So currently we are sitting very well with with uh, our contractors within the state of Wyoming and our vendors as well uh, are doing the lion's share of our work uh, on capital construction work that, that is moving forward at this time. Follow up, Senator Bebout. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I hope that as we move forward and you know, Wyoming's having some extremely difficult times right now with our budgets uh, without talking about school capital construction but clearly when we had the money we in our zest to spend, we overspent. Some of us tried to slow it down. I was not very successful at all. And if we move to the future, our revenues will come back. We know that. And I hope that we have the discipline so we just don't go out there and, and do what we did in the early, you know, 2011 to 2015 and try to spread it out because the state capital construction, whether for schools or our state, is a big part of what the local people do and bid on. And I, I don't know that percentage, but I would bet that 25 to 30 percent of the construction going on in our state has to do with state funded projects. So the discipline will be down the road when the revenues return and they will to be able to do it in a timely manner. I don't think there's a question there, Mr. Chairman, just a just a thought. Thank you. Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, I think it really is an important discussion that we're having here. And I, um, I I would kind of like to go back to what Senator Rothfuss and then what he, uh, Senator Bebout just poised is, I think we have a good process for, for budgeting for buildings. I think where we've got out of, of line perhaps is just like uh, Senator Rothfuss pointed out on the John Schiffer School. So the school goes on to a, a community college campus. They feel that they want to make it match the rest of the, the campus buildings. That's fine, but that's not probably within line of what that school would have been outside that environment. And so I, I think we have to have to look at what would constitute an enhancement in, in, in that manner and be more dedicated to ensuring if, if that's what the locals want, that they're willing to um, pay for those enhancements th themselves. I think we have a pretty tight um, 
I, I think we have a pretty tight handle on how the budget should look, but I think that we've been somewhat um, relaxed in how we uh, let some of these enhancements and uh, to some degree go by. And I, I just think we're going to have to have to tighten up around some of that stuff. And that's, that's my uh, oration on, on the matter, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you're, mu you're muted. Thank you for the reminder. Great question there, Representative Larson. Certainly appreciate it. Any further discussion? Representative Freeman. Then I'll get to you, Director Muldrow. And I agree with everything that uh, Representative Larson said, but uh, in the, the, um, the alternative school that was built in, uh, in Sweetwater County, uh, we saved millions of dollars from property costs by putting it in the, on the college campus. We also saved a lot of monies that we didn't have to replicate for CTE programs and that kind of stuff. So I, I think that I agree with everything that he says, but we have to look at the whole scope of, of, of what each one of the projects has. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Muldrow. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to do a follow up just to, to make a comment. You're right. Uh, we're statutorily required to, to do the most cost effective remedies and all that when we look at these projects. But one of the, one of the points I think um, uh, I wanted to make was that, you know, we uh, these projects do get value engineered, as you know, we look at everything from um, how the projects lay out and all. And, and I think that the, the question is, when you talk about how you can save money, I, I think one of the things that we tend to miss, and I think everybody's aware is, it's we put a lot of projects on the street sometimes too. And if you've got a lot of work out there, uh, contractors have a tendency, and again, not picking on contractors, but contractors have a tendency to bid high on a lot of projects sometimes too, because they've got work and this new work sometimes is, is a little bit challenging to them. And so sometimes you'll see inflated costs for projects. And when you see that inflation, of course, that square footage cost is gonna go up also. Um, you know, and when we look at it, so, and one of the other things is when we talk about these new projects, I always like to remind everybody that, you know, asset preservation is the, the, the key here. We're replacing a, a lot of old buildings, as you know, and a lot of them are being replaced because the, uh, uh, um, major maintenance. And it's important that we continue to spend money on major maintenance so we can get longer life out of these buildings. And I think we can, with that, continue to um, to keep these these buildings a little bit longer. You know, even now, as you know, uh, we're funding major maintenance as soon as that building comes off the, off the, uh, off the line and becomes active. Where before we had that graduated program, now we're putting major maintenance money that right away, which should help us to, um, to, to keep those buildings longer. So I just wanted to make that point, sir. Very good, Representative Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't, I, I don't wanna belabor this point, but, but I, I certainly would like to see what our options are, you know, what are some options that we could have to either value engineer or lower our expectations? And, you know, what is the result of that? So. If, Paul says that that's a possibility. I don't know why we don't examine that idea. Representative Summers, we'll get to some of those later in the day today. Uh, Paul, if you have a brief statement you wanna make on that now, you're welcome to, but I know we're going to go into some cost savings discussions later today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I will note, and, and one of the things that we, we keep in mind uh, within the department itself that our, our Constitution itself does identify the need for excellence. And uh, we've, we've been responding to that because that is the directive by the Constitution. Um, and and I, I know that uh, obviously we can, we can do different than what we're doing, but we have been trying to achieve excellence as, as it suggests. Perfect. Keep up the good work. Thank you. I think with that committee, we'll move on, unless there's further questions on this topic, we'll move on to request number three. Mr. Chairman. That's Mr. Troy. Chairman, Troy Decker. Yes, Troy. Good morning. You're making the presentation uh, on request number three, Troy. Thank you. 
Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me okay? We can hear you loud and clear. Proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Planning Supervisor, State Construction Department. We're on page 39, uh, tab three. So one of the requests that the committee had was uh, basically just to follow up on clarification of language on the capacity methodology, the commission's capacity methodology to assist people in understanding the table, uh, the capacity table. You wanted a background a ground on where the 85% utilization rate in state statute came from. And you wanted a recommendation for adjusting capacity based on class size formula and utilization rates. So we'll take those one at a time. So here's the responses. Uh, language clarification, first of all. Um, so down below the in the methodology, we originally had SF slash students, that meant square foot feet per student, and then restricted capacity. Uh, and then our recommended changes is uh, we just spelled out square feet per student, which is fine. Uh, the restricted capacity, we uh, actually have a committee that we work with made up of some school districts, uh, commissioners, and other stakeholders, uh, a governing documents committee. And we kind of looked at that restricted capacity descriptor, and we decided that that was the best descriptor to, uh, for um, the heading of the column of how many students are permitted in a, in a room. What we chose was to do a footnote, and you can see down below clarifying footnotes. And we basically uh, just have, within the methodology, defined what restricted capacity means. So restricted capacity means that the School Facilities Commission has set a limit for the number of students that are counted in a classroom, even though the room may be able to hold more students because of its size. So we felt like that was the best way to communicate and define that restricted capacity. Notice we made the same change down below on middle school, junior high, high school table. I'm not showing you the whole table. That's not the purpose of the presentation. And uh, in following this, where when we get into utilization rates, notice that the upper one is elementary utilization rate is 100% for homerooms, and down on the middle school, junior high, high school, uh, high schools utilization rate is 85%. Well, so on page uh, four, Troy, would you Troy, would you explain why you're 100% for the elementary school and utilization rate, and 85% at the middle and middle of junior high and high school utilization rate? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if it's okay with the, the chair, I'll go ahead and explain that in the next page here under state statute and the, and the rationale that, uh, state, uh, that the legislators, I think, at least referenced when they made that change. Uh, would that be okay, Mr. Chair? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, page 40 then, um, in, I, I, went, I, I went back to 2011, didn't go before that. Uh, but uh, in Wyoming Statute 2115-115, um, it just talks about basically um, uniform adequacy standards. And down in Roman numeral six, building capacity criteria aligned to the prescribed state educational program with consideration given to utilization uh, differences between school sizes. So in 2011, that statute existed. And in 2011, also new language was added, uh, 2115 117. Um, this whole section was added for any building uh, subject to paragraph A3 of this section. And when prioritizing buildings and facilities based upon condition uh, of this section, the commission shall consider criteria for building capacity established by commission rule and regulation, which include. And then you, uh, the, the legislature also added these uh, five uh, Roman numerals. Uh, it includes a comparison of the existing projected student population, that's Roman numeral one. Two, an analysis of the number of classrooms within the building. The methodology includes that. An analysis of the building square footage per student. We do uh, have that. An examination, Roman numeral four, an examination of loading and utilization factors for that building to encourage, uh, and this is the key, I think, to encourage the efficient use of classrooms, educational space. And number five, uh, total, uh, total acreage of the site. So that was added in, uh, to the statute in 2011. Then in 2012, in June, the School Facilities Commission was, was using a utilization rate of 95% for elementary schools and 85% for middle school, high schools. I think they had that locked into rules and regs or policy. 
At the select committee meeting that year, uh, uh, research by Dr. Rich Cedar, Emergent Policy and Systems, was presented uh, for recommended utilization rates of 100%, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, 100% for elementary schools, 90% for middle schools, and 85% for high schools. His research was based on data analysis between 15 states. I've listed the states. Dr. Cedar employed the following rationale within the study justifying his recommendation. So here's an answer to your question, Mr. Chair. Uh, in elementary, the students remain in a homeroom most of the day, leaving for specials only, like music, art, physical education. Since each class has a homeroom, uh, when they're out of the classroom, that's fine. When They never need another room other than special, so they always have that homeroom 100% of the time. That's why, basically, there's no. Uh, it's not necessary for other classes to use their homeroom because they have their own homerooms. That's why the 100% utilization rate, elementary utilization rate, was chosen. Uh, and in the middle school, high schools, uh, as you well remember, the, uh, the rationale there for a utilization rate is that students exchange classes according to a block schedule or a traditional six or seven periods model or maybe a variance thereof. Um, there, is, uh, there is also um, an assumption that at least some classrooms are distinct in their uses and are limited in serving other types of courses. So obviously, if you have a, a woodworking lab or something, uh, you know, you're probably not going to be teaching math in that, uh, in that or food science or whatever. Uh, so uh, one of the things that was interesting in my research is uh, uh, Chairman Harshman at that time requested that Fanning Howey also review, which he was a consultant, uh, the recommendations of emergence policy and provide feedback. Uh, so Fanning Howey made the recommendation for a utilization factor of 100% in elementary schools and 85% in middle, middle high schools. The rationale by Fanning Howey presented to the uh, select committee was this. Elementary schools typically do not uh, apply a utilization factor. Students may move to other spaces for enrichment classes. No other classes use the homeroom. Utilization rate, 100%. Building capacity equals the functional capacity. So whatever that capacity is, is because the homeroom carries the full capacity and is always available for that class to use at any time. In the middle school, high schools, typically applying utilization factor, which makes sense. We've already talked about some of those points. Students rotate from class to class. Uh, They can schedule other classes in each classroom. So, you know, if it's a general classroom, you can have all kinds of subjects within that, uh, not just math or something like that. Uh, uh, They cannot uh, schedule 100% utilization rates. You even have different sizes of classes, maybe upper level courses versus uh, freshman courses. Uh, So those upper level courses may have fewer students within there. Uh, And then the teacher planning period, right? They have to have a place or a space to plan at least once a day and then apply. And so they recommended an application of 85% uh, utilization. Uh, And then the functional capacity is typically 85% of building capacity. So in 2013, after uh, that, those reports were given, the legislature added on 21-15-115, you can see down below uh, on Roman numeral six, they added uh, this last sentence, and I'll just read it, building capacity criteria aligned to the prescribed state educational program with consideration given to utilization differences between school sizes, and here's the addition, and school levels in accordance with 21-15-117-E4. And notice down below that uh, the legislature also added to 21-15-117 uh, a clarification of utilization factors. It wasn't just based on the commission's decision now, but it was actually established state statute. And they added with a factor of 85% of the instructional area applied to the middle school, high school levels, uh, and a factor of 100% of homeroom instructional area applied to elementary school buildings. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's the the his, history of the statute. Uh, any questions before I get into uh, some potential um, recommendations for the select committee? Questions, committee? Any questions? Not seeing any. Uh, so go ahead, Troy, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so on page 42 of 78, Um, We tried to replicate some past presentations we gave you, uh, and so we'll kind of get into this. Uh, So uh, this is really on, this page is on elementary schools. The next page, page 43, is going to be on uh, basically the middle school, high school utilization rate. So reminder, 100% utilization rate. uh, So there's, you know, it's just whatever the functional capacity of the building is based on the methodology for elementary schools. 
Um, I did put in here, and I, I, I do apologize, uh, it was super small, but I did bring in the WDE funding model, FTE ratio. And just to remind, and we had this uh, previous discussion in select committee and past meetings, that uh, kindergarten through sixth grade, uh, if it's in the elementary uh, context, is 16, uh, basically uh, the funding model funds one, one uh, FTE per 16 students. Uh, for 712, grades 7 through 12, 21, uh, for uh, t uh, one FTE for 21 students. And then if, uh, if fifth or sixth grade are tied to a middle school, they also um, are calculated at 21. So it can be five through 12 if they're tied to the middle school in some way, shape, or, 12, uh, or uh, you know, fifth through eighth, fifth through ninth, sixth through 12, or whatever. On the left, I'm just setting up uh, kind of the foundation for the discussion here. On the left is just a, uh, an excerpt from the commission methodology. And remind, uh, reminder of everybody that pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, and first grade uh, is in accordance with state statute, there's an established square foot per student type of thing. It's 50 square feet per student. So these uh, children are very um, uh, tactile in their learning. Uh, they need more square footage and it's a restricted capacity of 16 on the commission methodology. Grades two through three, we hop down to 40. Uh, they're now transferring into more of a cognitive learning style somewhat. 40 square feet, feet per child, and then 16 restricted capacity in those classrooms. And then grades four through six, 40 square feet per student, and then restricted capacity of 25. So with that, when we move down, I've got three lines here, three examples uh, that Amber Leach and our department uh, put together for us and I appreciate her. Um, so our kindergarten through first grade, uh, remember it's 50 square feet per student. So uh, if you have a, uh, let's just look at this, uh, and number 16, there's two columns below it. This represents if restricted capacity is at 16 from commission, uh, commission methodology, which it is, uh, then it would require a classroom of 800 square feet because you just take your 50 square feet per child into it. It uh, drives 16 students. Uh, and uh, if that's the case, which it is, and the restricted capacity 16, then what we did is we looked at the number of fully utilized spaces. So we have a total, you can see on below of each of the pairs of 17, 18, 19, you have 906 classrooms throughout the state that are designated as kindergarten or first grade. And so out of those 906 uh, uh, classrooms under the 16 columns, fully utilized spaces, there are 23% of the, the kindergarten first grade classrooms are 800 square feet or less, which means they are fully utilized. 23% of them are fully utilizing their space based upon that 16 students. That's the 204 classrooms out of the 906. Uh, at that restricted capacity of 16, the partially utilized spaces, 77% or 702 classrooms, uh, have more square footage that could be used in the calculation at 50 square feet per child, but is not because the commission methodology sets a limit at 16. You can follow that same uh, uh, thought pattern through the 17. If you were a fit 17 students, it would require a classroom of 850 square feet, 18 students, 900. And you can see basically how many of the rooms within that kindergarten first grade category throughout the state are fully utilized versus partially utilized uh, in each of the uh, restricted capacities if they were set at a different rate other than what they are today. I wanna to point out too, Mr. Chair, that, um, that uh, in kindergarten first grade, I kind of green highlight around 16, that is the commission methodology. If you go down to second and third grade, the commission methodology restricts the capacity to 16. So you can say, see that 0%, I'm now down to the second one, uh, at 40 square feet per child uh, and 16 students, if you uh, divided that into uh, uh, or out of or multiplied, you'd get a, a minimum room size of 640 square feet and 0% or only two classrooms would be fully utilized at the commission's uh, uh, 16 um, restricted capacity. And then 100% or, uh, I mean, this is, you know, rounding on percentage, 100%, basically 848% of those, uh, 848 of them would be partially utilized. So you can now go across on the second through third grade. And if the, or if the restricted capacity were changed at any 
particular number of restrictive capacity instead of the 16, you can show the utilization of those classrooms, uh, categorize the second and third as a percentage or a number under each of the double columns for restricted capacity. And then the last one, Mr. Chair, is uh, the last uh, row there, rows is fourth through sixth grade, methodology 40 square feet per student. And the commission does have a restricted capacity of 25, which means if you go clear to the far right, uh, that uh, it would require, uh, it basically says that um, 94% or 828 of the classrooms are 1,000 square feet or less and are fully utilized right now by the commission uh, uh, methodology and rule and reg. And then uh, only uh, 6% are partially utilized. So 6% of those or 50 of them are actually larger than 1,000 square feet. So Mr. Chair, uh, that's uh, before going on, I just want to pause there and, and see if you have any uh, needs before I go to the utilization rates. Committee, is everyone understanding his table and what he's describing there? Any questions? Any questions? Not seeing any hands, so I'll go ahead and proceed, Troy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on next page, page 43, uh, we have the middle school, high school, um, and impact of utilization rates. So um, again, uh, utilization rates for middle school, high school are set at 85% according to state statute. We've kind of developed this in such a way that kind of clarify the base data, the foundational data from the potential utilization rate changes if the legislature were uh, uh, chose to do so. So on the left column, we have the basically the school districts, um, we have the enrollment within those school districts, and that's brick and mortar enrollment. This is different than, this doesn't include your distance education and, and those kind of students. Uh, this is brick and mortar, the ones that actually uh, attend school in, in person or in the physical buildings. Uh, and then you have a column for percentage, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you would have district capacity. So based on the commission methodology, uh, 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 and this is K-6 by, or I'm sorry, K-12, by the way, and I'll tell you why we did that in just a moment. Uh, so you have, uh, for Albany 1, you have 5,069 uh, seats available, uh, according to the methodology, the commission's methodology. Percent of capacity there at 78%, so they have an available seat of 1,135 above their capacity, and this is K-12. And the reason we do K-12 is because we don't just purely have middle schools, high schools throughout the state. We have some K-8s, we have K-12s, uh, and uh, so um, we even have some maybe uh, six 12s. And so we have had to include the, the kindergarten in there uh, through sixth grade as well, but the utilization rate changes represent only utilization rate changes uh, at the high school and middle school level within those multi-grade uh, configurational buildings. So you can kind of look down and you can see at the very bottom the 92,416 enrollment for all uh, for brick and mortar uh, and then of course your district capacity uh, your your we have a total of 130,419 seats available 71 percent of our buildings are full uh, uh, with regards to the capacity methodology and we have uh, available seats above and beyond uh, uh, the uh, the um, the capacity as 38,003 seats. So with that, then, if you made a change in utilization rate, what impact would that be in a statewide, let Chairman. alone a district by district um, basis? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Senator Bebout. Yeah, I think Reverend Larson had his hand up first, and I have a quick question. Okay, Representative Larson. Sorry, I was reading as we went. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so. Uh, Troy, what I what I heard you say is is looking at that bottom line, and I, I I'm not reading it the same way you said it, so I need to make sure that I'm understanding correctly. You pointed out the 92,000 enrollment district capacity of 130,000. Then you you said 71% of the schools are at capacity, and the way I read this is that we are at 71% of the total capacity with remaining with that much available. Am I reading it wrong or help me clarify what you said there? Thank Go you, ahead, Mr. Troy. Chairman. His interpretation is correct. And if I said that wrongly, I apologize. Thank you. Follow Thank up, you. Representative Larson, are you happy? I was, I, I, I don't read charts real well. I just wanna make sure that I was seeing it right. 
Senator Bebout. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just took a quick look at this. And, and when I look at it, uh, the school districts that seem to be totally uh, over capacity are, are the smaller ones. And the larger school districts are the ones that are higher in terms of capacity. And, and I, I, I understand why and the, the dynamics of it seems to me that, of course, it's already done and in place. But the question would be as we move forward and, and you know, after our robust building site, we just went through a lot of new schools being built. But is there anything we might do and why the smaller districts, uh, maybe it's just a, just a generic thing that they have to have X amount of square footage because they're a school district. But they're all uh, way, their, their percentages are much lower than the larger districts. What, what could we do or is there anything we could do to, to bring that, uh, you know, it'd be neat to see uh, about an 80 or 85% capacity. And if you do that, it's mostly the small districts. It's really hard to justify building anything when you have 71% as far as our capacity issues, unless you're doing for replacement. Troy? Mr. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, obviously um, in a lot of rural school districts, you have fewer students. And uh, within that, when it comes to capital funding recommendations, by far the majority of those have, have by far been for condition of buildings. Uh, and uh, it is observable and uh, evident that the larger school districts are uh, obviously those communities where uh, the populations are growing uh, and, uh, and, the, and those schools are filling up. So um, yeah, it's, the capital requests have been driven primarily, I'd say very much primarily, uh, on, on the condition of buildings. However, when you go back to a place like um, uh, uh, Star Valley, uh, that is a valley that uh, because of, of the uh, limited availability and cost of housing up north, um, uh, that, that is a rural community and it has been growing and, and the, the legislature did appropriate funds for a capacity project there. Well, Mr. Chairman, just a quick follow-up to that. So if it's a condition situation, what you're saying then, Troy, is that when we look at a condition and we build a new school, we have a tendency to plan for the future and maybe over, overbuild, if you will, based on, and if you look at the history of Wyoming, 20 years ago, we had 93,000 students. Now we have 90. So probably build into the way we do it rather than have it, we do a reconditioned building rather than have it in five, six years be a capacity issue, we, we actually overbuild on the front end. I guess that would be a fair assessment. Mr. Chairman, state statute did change a while ago and uh, increased uh, uh, the, the legislature chose to uh, go five years after substantial completion. So we projected out to those. And if a community was in a growing pattern, that projection, obviously, uh, what we didn't want, and I think what the legislature intended was, you didn't want to build at that time as growth was occurring quicker uh, within Wyoming and communities. The legislature, I don't think, wanted to undersize a building. And then by the time it's built uh, two or three years later, it's already at capacity uh, and they don't have enough room. So I, I think that that was a response. And certainly we followed the leadership of the legislature in that. But in down times, I, I might point out too that when we started getting, uh, when, when uh, mineral royalties went down, and, and I recall in Casper, a select committee meeting, Mr. Chairman, where uh, the, the thought of the, that the enrollment projections had a limited, um, a limited application with regard to responsive being responsive to economic conditions at present, because they look at historical enrollment rather than just present enrollment. So that was also a challenge that was, and, and an observation brought up at select committee in the past. Follow up, Senator, or are you happy with that? Okay. Representative Freeman. Uh, I understand the frustration what's going on, but on my first stand on the uh, school facilities, it was very common for us to build a school. And when the, the students moved in, it was under capacity already. So that's where uh, we've upped it to where that uh, we saw further into the future. Further questions about 
utilization rates and changes of utilization. Everyone's understanding that and how that works. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Representative Summers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, maybe just your thoughts or, or maybe it's back to Troy. Obviously they give us some options there to consider. Is that something we're thinking of doing is uh, shifting the utilization rate and uh, just curious of the chair's thoughts. Well, I think as you look on page 42 of 78, uh, they utilize that 16 to one and 21 to one based on the, the WDE's funding of that. Uh, but at 16 to one, we are certainly underutilized. And if you were to move it up to 20, you get a lot closer on the K, K kindergarten first, you get a lot closer to that 85% utilization and so maybe it's something we'd want to recommend to the commission to start looking at at upping that uh, classroom utilization a little bit for for design and for capacity calculations it would it would in doing so you automatically create some cost savings because the a school does not fill up as quickly on a capacity related issue because of that uh, that change in calculation Certainly not advocating one way or the other, just noting that that's uh, something that could be changed for a cost savings rather easily. Representative Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, just quickly, that seemed like that 85% set in statute. So is that, uh, that, is that correct? I think that's what it showed you know, back in the statute review. So is that something then that we would need to consider as a change? I guess, Troy, I'll ask you that question. If we want to if we want to see a change in this, is that something we have to do statutorily? Mr. Chairman, that is established within state statute and we do follow that within our methodology, the commission does. And so we could not change that in rule and reg or methodology unless state statute supported it. Representative Summers, if you read the entire statute though, it says an examination of loading and utilization factors for the building for that building to encourage efficient use of, of classrooms with a factor of 85% of instructional area applied to middle schools and 100% to elementary schools. So it's it's encouraged, It's I wouldn't say it's a shall be, you know, if you change that encourage word to shall or may, uh, you know, it, it changes how they have to do it. And so it's, it's not a, a hammer on them, it's just a, general guideline that they would go that direction. And that's shown in the chart that while it's encouraged, certainly aren't hitting that 85% utilization rate by using the 16 to one, they're hitting closer to 23% uh, utilization rate. It's not until they get up to 21, what did I see, 20 students per, per that they hit the 85 that's encouraged. If, if I'm reading it, it correctly, Troy, but that's what I see, Representative Summers. Senator Rothman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'm not sure that, that what was just expressed was exactly right in, in terms of reaching the 85% um, based on, on the use cases. And uh, I, I think we, we've got different percentages here representing different things. When you're calculating the space for the building, at the 85 on the 85 percent on the utilization factor, it really comes down to the calculation of the number of square feet that are going to be designed for uh, when you're putting the building together, uh, and then obviously we've got the other restrictions in the classroom. And and Mr. Chairman, you know I remember when we worked on that 85 percent, and the proposal that kind of came to the committee was, hey, let's get rid of that. Uh, you know, if if we had 100 percent, we would save money, and. So we worked on that during the interim, and I think it was actually at 80%, if I'm not mistaken, as the, uh, and I'd, I'd check with someone who's been around uh, for a while from the department. Um, I, I feel like we started at 80% and we switched it to 85% perhaps as, as a committee when we worked on it, uh, but we were considering taking it to 100% and adjusting how it was done. And what it really came back as is that we would then just have to find a, a different way to evaluate some of the other square footage that were in the was in the building. 
uh, because there, there was no way to achieve a 100% utilization factor based on the way that we considered square footage in elementary schools and in high schools. So at that point in time, my recollection is we changed from 80 to 85. We were comfortable with that, but we were not comfortable moving forward with a policy change that would take it from 85 to, a, to 100 because it, it basically just defied the way that, that things were um, were re reasonably and realistically uh, done. In other words, it was it was effectively unachievable. So while it, it looks good on paper, it, it didn't look good in reality when we took the testimony, Mr. Chairman. So I don't remember which year that was that we we looked at that, but I, I just wanted to provide that background that that we did work this topic as a interim topic on the select committee a number of years ago and considered that alternative. <laughs> Thank you for that historical pers perspective. I think it's great. And uh, and yeah, I'm certainly not advocating to change that 85% to 100%, just pointing out on the, the charts where you could change the number of students in the classroom and get closer to hitting that 85% by increasing the number of students a, a few. Further questions on this topic? Mr. Finney, I see you've been pretty quiet all morning. Do you have any thoughts on this from a historical perspective? Good afternoon or good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Brandon Finney. Uh, I currently don't, I think Troy's covered it quite well. We've uh, been through this for a couple of years, uh, settled in on where we're currently at with the school districts or uh, commission's methodology. Uh, as Troy alluded to, they could do some statute changes and adjust the numbers, but is it get the uh, intent? I don't know. So. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions on this topic? All right. If I check my agenda correctly, I think we're scheduled for a break. And then the next topic is suitability. Is that accurate, uh, Leanne? Mr. Chairman, yes, that is accurate. All right. So with that, I think we'll take about a 12 minute break. We'll try and be back about 1020 if we could committee. So 1020 will resume. Thanks everyone.
Okay, it looks like most of the committee has returned. Giving it a quick glance here. With that, I think we'll go ahead and get started again. And I think we are on, uh, excuse me, tab number four, and this is a suitability. And, and uh, this has been a major topic of discussion the last couple of years. And so, uh, uh, Laura, are you in charge of the suitability discussion or who will be leading us through this suitability tab number four? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that will be Troy. Okay, Troy. Uh, committee, are there any questions before we get started? Representative Larson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just going back to that previous discussion on, on uh, utilization rate, is that utilization rate where, I, like I say, we see the 16 to 1, and I know we have that in the classroom sizes in the lower grades and stuff. Is that statutory, is that statutory uh, statute there also the means by which they make uh, the funding to the schools based on that utilization, utilization rate, or is that different? Mr. Go Chair, ahead. Troy Decker. Go ahead, Troy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the methodology that the commission has established uh, does not is not mandated by state statute with regard to restricted capacity. So when you see those numbers, 16, 17, 18, that is a restricted capacity for elementary school. Uh, and is not based on, um, I mean, it, it's impacted by the fact that there's 100% utilization rate. So in reality, in, in application, in practicality, there really is no utilization rate for elementary schools. It's whatever the functional capacity is based upon the uh, grade level in elementary and based upon the square foot per child and the restricted capacity. That is the calculation. So it is not uh, the 100% if you lowered it, which I, I, I assume you don't want to because those home rooms are 100% available to the students. Um, so it's basically whatever the, whatever the capacity methodology drives in restricted capacity and square foot per student, that is what the capacity is. Thank you. Representative Larson, you're happy with that answer? Okay, Representative Summers. Um, Mr. Chairman, just a quick note on that. Remember, we got rid of the 16 to 1 requirement in statute on facilities, I believe, uh, two or three years ago, if my memory serves me correct. Director Muldrow, do you remember how long ago that took place? If not, uh, Mr. Finney may be able to pipe in with the historical knowledge. Brandon. Mr. Chairman, Brandon Finney, uh, Representative Summers is correct. Uh, the intent there was to remove that statute. Our uh, legal counsel at that time did concur that that was done uh, on the district side. Obviously, different legal opinions on that uh, implementation there. And at that okay. time, we then went and adjusted uh, the methodology to reconcile to the new statute or made an attempt to. Uh, we, we never made it all the way through that adjustment. So we were going to remove the restricted capacity from 16 up to approximately 21. And uh, that never was 100% uh, successful. I believe we, we reverted back to the restricted at 16. Very good. Thank you. Representative, Representative Summers, that answer your question? Okay. Senator Bebout. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If the statute's not there requiring it, you tried to move the other way. Now, why are you not doing it? Troy? Mr. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, so the commission in its, uh, there was that requirement of 16 to 1 and then a waiver type of, uh, of exception through the WDE is my understanding process. Um, so when that was removed as a requirement, uh, that's when the commission um, felt that it maybe had some potential leeway to change that, uh, and it does. Uh, uh, but what happened was there was, uh, just to be honest with you, a tremendous uh, pushback by the districts. Uh, and so the, um, I think that the, and not to speak on behalf of the commission, but my impression is that the commission was really maybe uh, go ahead and, and, and leave, leave it as it is. 
Uh, and if the uh, legislature felt that um, perhaps the the utilization of spaces at the elementary grade level, again, back to that chart on page 42, right I'm now, like strict Senator capacity Roethlis. 16. Go ahead, Troy, continue. Okay, uh, back to that page 42, uh, that restricts past 16, they recognize that only 23% of the classrooms are actually being fully utilized and that 77% of those classrooms have more space. So is there a reasonable adjustment up? Uh, that, is, that, is, that could be determined as such, but they felt that maybe, maybe yielding to maybe some uh, committee or legislative direction in that, even though the 16 to 1 is not, no longer mandatory, uh, would be desirable probably from the commission, and, and they may, may have a more full, uh, full answer for you, but that was my impression. Senator Rothfuss, did you have a follow-up, Senator Bebout? Yeah, very quickly, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for recognizing. Sorry, Chris. I, I get it, Troy, what you're saying, but but you look at the ca capacity, the underutilization, and and clearly, I I would take. Uh, I, I think the commission might have moved in the wrong direction, but I understand the political pressure behind it. it. Just doesn't make any sense to build classrooms for a certain area and a certain size and not utilize them. Thank you, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I want to go back and reflect a little bit up, uh, upon the history there, too, and, and kind of the discussion we had over the years with regard to this topic. Uh, when that requirement was removed, it was really a reporting requirement that was removed three years ago. Uh, as that reporting requirement was removed, though, the, the concept was everyone was always putting in for a waiver that was unable to meet the 16 to 1. Uh, there was a general concern by districts and by some legislators that, well, if everybody's putting in a waiver every year, maybe we need to remove the requirement that they provide that report. Uh, we passed legislation that removed that, but what that was effectively taken as, and when you look at the statute, it was the only place that really said, thou shalt have 16 to 1. So it was taken by the commission as, all right, so you don't have to have 16 to 1 anymore. Uh, I don't think that was the intent, but that, that is the practical effect of the statutory change. Well, we have elsewhere in statute uh, the funding model, which really is what we try to use to, to drive successful and effective education, and we're working on that right now through the recalibration committee. The recommendation of our funding model and what we fund to is classroom ratios at K6 of 16 to 1 and classroom ratios uh, at 7 through 12 of 21 to 1. And we funded that way for years. So the disconnect and, and a big part of this discussion over the years is, should our building policy drive our educational policy in the state of Wyoming, or should our education policy and funding of teachers and funding of what's going on in the classrooms drive our buildings? So the pushback from this committee, Mr. Chairman and co-chairman, you'll recall, was the idea that we don't want decisions about how to educate students to be driven by the buildings themselves. We want that to be coming from the funding model and from decisions related to what is the best practice for providing a high quality education. And that's where these restrictions ended up staying in place because the commission looked at it and said, well, we've got capacity so we can remove this. And we pushed back, districts pushed back on the idea that no, the school funding model and the school foundation program uh, drive what the classroom size is, not decisions made by the School Facilities Commission. And I thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for providing that opportunity to uh, kind of weigh in on, on how that laid out for the, the good senator. Representative Summers, and I, then I'll get to you, uh, Co-Chairman Landon. Go ahead, Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, um, thank you. And Senator Rothfuss is, is accurate. I think where the disconnect is, is not so much in elementary where it's 100% capacity. So you're talking, you know, you're talking about a firm number 16, but when you start bumping to 85% capacity, then you're actually moving that number that's 21 to something else because it's, it's, it becomes a capacity issue. So I think there is certainly room within those upper two levels, middle school and junior high, 
to make some decision if we so chose on capacity, much like we do on elementary. So I, I think that's certainly uh, within our prerogative as a legislature. Co-Chairman Landon. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and I too uh, agree with Senator Rothfuss. Uh, I thought he did a good job of, of kind of um, encapsulating where we've been the last five or six years. Uh, just from a 30,000 foot view uh, for the select committee, I think, I think that all along our intention on the school facilities committee has been to make sure we're building good buildings. And we have done that. And we have also uh, assured ourselves that we have classrooms the size of which can react to policy changes that were alluded to by the Senator. For example, if the recalibration committee comes to the legislature with some recommendations therein, uh, it's good to know that we have the kind of school buildings out there that can handle 18 uh, first graders in a classroom, for example, or perhaps even 20 if we choose to do that. Uh, that is not something that the school facilities select committee has really wanted to delve into. Um, that policy is probably better driven over on the other side. And it's just our job as a select committee to make sure that we're reacting to and building the kind of buildings that are necessary to, to affect that policy. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Any further discussion on this topic? Uh, Senator Bebout. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good discussion. The only thing that you have to think about, and so when you build a school, you know, it's there for hopefully 30, 40, 50 years. And if you do it at 16 or under, then it's, it's there and that's what it is. You know, we may change and decide to have <clears throat> classroom size of 18, 19, 20. And of course, uh, then that's, that could be temporarily depending on our revenue stream. So, you know, I, I, I guess I would disagree a little bit with Senator Rothfuss, but we've had this debate before. I'd rather have uh, that, you know, that gone for sure. And of course it is not in statute, but leave that up to the, to the commission. And ultimately I think that decision should be made by this select committee on how we do it. But certainly, you know, when you build a building, it's there for a long period of time and the revenue relative to classroom size may change. Thank you. Senator Bebout, keep that mind, that thought in mind, and maybe at the end of the day, we can, you can propose a bill draft to uh, change that because it sounds like the commission would like to have some directive from the legislature, as opposed to the commission going out and deciding that on their own. So I think that's a, a good note to keep on your desk for the, to, to save for the end of the day. Senator Rothfuss. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And, and just a quick follow-up. I, I think the point that Senator Bebout made is a good one about being flexible. Uh, looking to the future and, and uh, co-chairman Landon kind of made the same point that when we're looking long term, uh, we are building and sizing classrooms not at the 16 to 1 ratio with, uh, with a appropriate square footage, but really at the 20 uh, or so to 1 as we're building them, which is part of the reason why we show these lower capacities and utilization rate. We, we're planning for an appropriate future uh, opportunity, and, and particularly if we have circumstances where you have um, overcapacity in the classrooms and, and, and you can't meet that 16 to 1. Uh, so this is a discussion that, again, we've been through over the years, making sure that we are future-proofing the classrooms, but the, the consequence of future-proofing the classrooms are these numbers that are providing concern to good Senator Bebout and some of the other members. Exactly, well put. Any further discussion on this topic? I think we've all got it hammered out and figured out and uh, recalibration will also have play a factor in this as that committee does their fine work. I, with that, I think we'll move on to the suitability discussion. Again, this is tab request number four. Uh, Senator Wasserberger, thank you for joining us. Good to see your smiling face today. And uh, with that, I think, uh, Troy, you are presenting the suitability or starting it. And then I see we have some, uh, some guests that have joined us as well that are part of the consulting firm. And so, Troy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. So on page 44 uh, of your booklet, the committee has requested an update on educational suitability. As part of the request, Representative Walters has also requested a list of participants 
for stakeholder meetings. And the third page of the presentation shows those in, in a categorical sense, uh, the attendees in the three stakeholder meetings we had. Uh, I can say without a doubt that we had excellent participation, uh, excellent input. I thought school districts uh, uh, and other stakeholders who are involved um, just really did an outstanding job. So we appreciate that. Uh, the State Construction Department on behalf of the School Facilities Commission uh, basically hired Cooperative Strategies, who's online right now. We have Scott Newell and David Sturtz, uh, uh, who will give a presentation in just a moment. Uh, basically to engage stakeholders in a collaborative process to define appropriateness of the student environment. Following stakeholder input, the consultant is now uh, working with us, the department, uh, to develop uh, an assessment tool to measure the identified elements. And once collected, data from a future assessment will be imported into the AIM database as part of a collective group of scores to contribute to the composite. We're going to, this is the first time we're introducing this to you. But state statute all brings it up to a single score for each building, and we're going to call it a composite facility index, a CFI, comprised of statutory requirements of capacity, condition, and adequacy. So the CFI, the composite facility index, will then be used to prioritize and uh, uh, for prioritization and recommendations from the commission to the select committee. So with that, we have a short. Uh, uh, presentation by Cooperative Strategies, and uh, if they could be unmuted, Scott Newell and uh, David Sturtz appreciate it, and uh, we'll have them give a short presentation and answer any questions you may have, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Proceed. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Greater Committee. It's a pleasure to be here today. Am I permitted to share my screen, or are we going to just walk through um, and I'll kind of walk you through with what you have in your packet. Uh, I think we can have our administrator share your screen. Let me double check. Karen, uh, can you share his screen or allow him to share his screen and that way we can walk through it a little easier? He's welcome to share his screen. I've set that up for him. Okay, go ahead, Scott, and share your screen and we'll proceed. Okay, it looks like we've got it here. And as I mentioned, my name is Scott Newell, and I'm the CEO of Cooperative Strategies. And with me today is David Sturtz. And in a strange twist of fate, um, he was the lead consultant on the state of Hawaii's master plan uh, two years ago. We did the master plan for the state of Hawaii. So we were messaging each other this morning, kind of jumping out of our chairs, talking and listening. And um, it's really great to hear everything you guys have been talking about today. I think you've got a lot of great things going for you. Other key members of our team, just so you, you know who's been part of this process on our end, Carrie Ann Wolf is our educational specialist. Kevin Huber is the executive director of our Colorado office, and he couldn't be with us today as he's procuring architects for a school district in Northern Colorado. And Dr. Wilson down there in the bottom right is an acting superintendent for Brush School District in Northeast Colorado, and that made up our key stakeholder group. One of the nice uh, benefits that actually occurred by doing these meetings virtually was that we got to have some folks come with us at each meeting and see how the process evolved and, and have that kind of dynamic evolution of this through that, that reoccurring stakeholder group. So um, a, a product of having these virtual meetings that worked out well in our, our favor. As you saw here, we had a, a great turnout at each meeting and had a lot of really good discussion. Our Zoom meetings did a lot of group discussions and we did breakout um, meetings with smaller groups, much like you would in a face-to-face -face setting to discuss topics and then report out on the back end. The topics that we discussed, um, obviously the statutory requirements that were involved in determining these factors and then the specifics that make up educational suitability. Uh, and that specifically is illumination, indoor air quality, tech readiness, which we'll talk about separate from the last piece, which is the educational environment. Beyond that, we then looked at how to weight all these, if they should have an equal weight or if they should have uh, specified weights to show a matter of importance. And then looked at some of the outcomes and the methodology, which Troy indicated we are still finalizing those as we are going through some of these specifics of each of these. Feel free at any time to ask any questions and David may jump in too at certain points. 
most of you are probably familiar with the specifics of the state statute here. Um, and I'm going to just move something over here on my computer screen so I can see a little better. And in the case of brevity here, we'll move on to the first three specifics. Those were illumination, indoor air quality, and tech readiness. What we arrived at through our stakeholder meetings was the following. For illumination, lighting levels will be assessed using a light meter. And if the lighting levels are below the recommended design foot candles, a deficiency will be noted for each space within a school. Indoor air quality has been a, a topic we've been going back and forth with quite a bit. Uh, to summarize it here, indoor air quality will be assessed using a questionnaire and a portable indoor air quality meter to test the indoor learning spaces, mechanical rooms, corridors for the levels of CO2 relative humidity temperature. Any areas outside of the acceptable range will be noted. This one here, just to expand upon that a little bit, we've had a lot of discussions uh, recently on, on different recommendations on how to approach this from a, a monitoring standpoint, from an occupancy loaded standpoint and then a uh, snapshot in time. And so this particular one is, is further evolving and we intend to make some recommendations to the department on how to approach this in a way that would give the most data to consider. Last piece here is uh, tech readiness. Yes, I'm gonna interrupt you briefly. Uh, areas outside of the accept, acceptable range, who is creating what is the accept, acceptable range? Is that a national standard? Is that a state standard? What are what would that be? And maybe you get into it further in the presentation. Sure, and, and you know, in summary right now, we're pulling upon some, some codes, some standards, some regs that are, are national, and those will be further refined as we move into it. But really they're, they're drawing upon sources that have evaluated this in regulation. And, and, and Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, this, this particular number comes from ASHRAE standards, uh, looking at 1100 parts per million of CO2 or less as being acceptable and exceeding 1100 parts per million as being unacceptable. So the acceptable is more on the CO2 than the humidity and temperature. Uh, speaking to CO2 specifically, yes, sir. There's, okay. There are optimal ranges for the others, but CO2, uh, we are weighting the most heavy in terms of IAQ. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Please proceed, Scott. Mr. Uh, Chairman. All right, uh, Representative Larson and committee members, speak up because I don't have all of you on the screen all the time. So speak up if I miss you. Representative Larson. Thank you. Scott, going back to lighting, did you differentiate between artificial and, and natural light? Is there is on 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 the lighting stuff, is there it, it, was that brought into the discussion? David or Scott? So uh, this is David speaking in terms of, of measuring and quantifying the difference. No, sir, we did not uh, distinguish between the two. We are looking at lumen levels in different points around the room. However, when it comes to other portions of the suitability assessment, we are looking at the presence or absence of windows and the operability of those windows. So that comes in in a separate uh, measure that we study. But I thought I thought these were the three items of suitability that you were looking at that were important. So now are you telling me that there's going to be some some other things that come into play as well? Uh, uh, sir, so yet for ability, which is a composite of uh, the uh, indoor air quality tech and illumination is one component, but then the, uh, the presence of the space types themselves and the requirements within those spaces is another set of requirements that feeds into educational suitability, which we will address uh, further on in, in this presentation, showing how they fit together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, further Mr. question? Senator Bevout. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a little follow up to, to your question. It was a good question. So when you have these quality standards out there, so what environment is it for? Is it for, uh, is it for a typical office building where you have a uh, wide open spaces, you know, partitioned off, or is it for an enclosed office building? Uh, you know, it's all in the matter of how you develop these relative to the area that you're talking about. So is, do you feel good enough that these quality standards you're using would fit the description of a classroom? And so how do they develop them? I, you know, standards are standards and typically what people will do to develop these, they go way overboard and, and, and you know, to err on the side of having higher standards than you may not, not 
you may need, really need. So, so how do you develop these relative to a classroom? Go ahead, David. Uh, so that's a good question. And in this particular uh, question for IAQ, you know, if you want to look at sort of danger to human health, the the, the parts per million are, are five times the level that we're talking about. Um, so we don't want to even flirt with that particular uh, kind of, of challenge. What we are, so, so it is conservative in that respect. The, portion, the, the reason for the 1100 has to do with um, studies on cognitive functioning and the effects <laughs> of CO2 levels on cognitive functioning. And that the, the notion that is that at and above that level, there is a demonstrable impact on co cognitive functioning. And so that is the, the level that we chose to stay under for a classroom. Whereas your ideal range is more in the 400 to 600 uh, parts per million or, or thereabouts, uh, 1100 is where you start to notice uh, differences uh, per ash ray. So the follow up to that, Mr. Chairman, was right. did, you have a, did you have a placebo when you analyzed that particular variances? And certainly we want to err on the side of conservative and be responsible in that regard, but I still not. You know, there's a big range between 500 and 1100, and even you go up to 18 or 1900 or five times it for to be in the danger zone. We don't need to get into yes, sir. It's already established, but it's, there's certainly a lot of questions about the, what standards we use. And so that is a fair question. And I, I will state that uh, we did not ourselves uh, do any kind of assessments and testing to publish study in, uh, by ourselves for this particular standard. We did reference ASHRAE, and I will note that in looking with working with school districts around the country on this particular matter, uh, particularly because of COVID, that about a thousand parts per million is uh, a standard that many districts, uh, states are using uh, as, a, as a benchmark. So that's uh, something, uh, using the ASHRAE was something we felt comfortable in because it was a, it's a uniform uh, and accepted standard and to expand upon that, one of the things that we are still working on that we plan to bring to the committee in the near future is some options on how to assess this. So as Troy indicated, we're still mm -hmm. working on the, the actual assessment piece right now. And this particular one has been a topic of conversation on, on the data points and where to collect the data points. Is it one classroom? Is it a classroom, a corridor, a open air space? Uh, do we want to do it when the space is, is loaded slash occupied um, mm -hmm. and, and other data points that will give the most realistic uh, data set of what's happening in that school uh, when kids are, are occupied in the school. And so the, the result of that right now, um, and, and there is, as you guys are probably well aware, depending on where you go, there's a cost associated with that um, decision on tools that are used to collect it, the length of time they need to be at schools, do all schools need them, et cetera. And so the intent right now is to provide you with a few different options to consider that will provide a range of data sets that um, you guys can make the determination on what you think is, is the best fit uh, moving forward as you go to assess school spaces. Okay, continue, Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the next piece here on this slide is tech readiness and technology readiness will focus on the ability of the school facility to support and distribute available services, power and internet at the convenience for users to connect to those services. And so this looks at two pieces, the availability of uh, IT infrastructure coming to the school. So what's even allowed <laughs> to come to the school and what's connected. And then the second piece is how it's being distributed throughout the building. And so there will be a survey and deficiencies will be noted there. Moving on, when you, you look here, and I'm moving between screens here, so if you're looking at my face, I apologize here. All of this rolls up into the appropriateness of the student environment, and you see down there that last little piece that's highlighted we will get into as the fourth part of this, this metric here, which then goes into the overall condition in statute, which is a weight of the facility condition assessment and the appropriateness of the student environment. And we'll get into how we've... Um, looked at those later in this presentation and what the results of the stakeholder engagement was for that. And then that goes up into the three data points you see there, which is condition, capacity, educational adequacy, which then rolls up into a comprehensive building composite or building condition score. 
So the fourth piece of this here is the spaces themselves and the educational suitability, the appropriateness of the student environment. And so we're gonna kind of walk through what we presented to start and how it evolved and what the results of each of these considerations were. So when we started out, we wanted to ask the basic questions here. Does the facility have the needed spaces to support teaching and learning today? The second one we think is very important. Do the educational spaces within the facility have the critical basics to function for the identified use? So for us, we know uh, schools have been built throughout time with different funding sources, different levels of extravagance, if you will, and they all have different things in them. We really wanted to set the stage and say for every single space that's in a school, what do we determine for the state of Wyoming to be the critical basics for that space? What do we think is important no matter where a school is located, no matter what grade level? And so that's when we tried to put some framework around identifying what the components should be within these spaces here and present those to the group and have them further refined. Number three there talks about adjacencies. So uh, you can think about egress paths, bathrooms, um, ADA services, things like that. So whatever a particular space is, does it have the appropriate adjacencies next, next to it to function as intended? And then how do you score a space within a building? Does every space have an equal weight? Does an educational classroom have the same weight as an administrative space within a building? We want to explore that there. One of the big uh, challenges was to, to look at a state perspective and say, once these are developed, can they be transferred across the state? Um, are they easy to understand? Are they consistent with the educational measures of, of the state of Wyoming? Um, anecdotally, I, before coming here, worked for the Department of Education at the state of Colorado and was in charge of their division of capital construction. And we were charged with doing a statewide assessment. And mm -hmm. Later, uh, two years later, we found out that some of the folks in transportation and nutrition, for example, had specific requirements that they were looking for. And they said, oh, you're, you're out assessing. Are you looking for these things too? And we go, well, no, we're not. And they go, well, can you? And so wanting to, to also make sure that these are consistent with the educational suitability measures uh, outside of just facility. And then for all measures, are they broad? Do they respect the local role? As we know, um, that's very important. And do they provide real meaning? We want data that's collected to provide real meaning and not just data that sits on a shelf. And that's how we started. So the first thing here, scoring a space. And so we asked these basic questions here and I, I guess I don't need to reiterate what they are, but does it exist? Uh, is it configured the way it's supposed to? And does it have the adjacencies nearby? And so as you can see here, if the space existed, we gave it 66% out of 100. So Great, the space is present in the building, that's important. Um, and then if there was an adjacency, at this point we, we said there was no additional merit to that. Mr. But then Chairman, the last- Representative yes, Summers, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Scott, just kind of back on, uh, does the space exist? Um, and maybe you're gonna go into more detail as you go along on this particular piece, but we just had a discussion you know, on new buildings. So we're creating space in new buildings every every year or every other year or whenever we do it now. And so how do you determine, you know, how does that fit in? In other words, how do, how do our building standards today fit into does the space exist or does it exist appropriately? And so, um, and then ultimately how will how will this assessment figure into how we are going to have to build new buildings going forward? So is this going to have an impact on how we build new buildings going forward, let alone how we assess older buildings for, for rebuild or uh, as part of condition? Thanks, I can address we, that when, uh, you're, when you're done, Scott. David? Yeah, I think what, if you don't mind, we are gonna, we are gonna explore that. And um, we'll look at the, the slides after this that kind of identify the spaces we identified first. But I think David, maybe talking about some of these, this topic was brought up during our, our stakeholder meetings and talk about how that evolved. And I'll use the one that came up the most as an example, which was the music classroom. And 
and first deciding if a music classroom, standalone classroom was, was a space that should be in, uh, let's say an elementary school. And then the topic further went on to say, well, what if it was a space that used to be a art classroom that was reconfigured to a music classroom? Or what if it's a, a classroom that moves around? Um, so the, it's a floating music classroom. How does that play into it? And David, if you want, um, you can expand upon that a little bit here as we move into these, this next one. If you want to take the next couple slides, David, feel free. Sure, sure, I can do that. And I'll be brief on that question. It's, Repres it's solid Representative one. Summers, does that get to your answer or, or you're ready to listen to what they have to say and hope it gets to it there? Thank you, please proceed, David. Okay, so as Scott said, we're looking at essentially looking at a, a list of spaces and there's a core set of spaces for elementary, middle and high school that in discussion with stakeholders, we identified, created a, a foundation of space types to support modern teaching and learning uh, that still that respected, you know, the critical basic logic that we or we approached here. And I'll explain each of those space types in the next slide. And so, uh, first of all, does does this space uh, exist? And that's the that's these are the spaces right here. You know, if if the space is in use, so they say, okay, obviously, you know, you have your standard classrooms, right? But you also have special education, extended learning areas, more of your flex areas or project-based learning areas, uh, which could be a, a, a library or media center if that's being utilized as such. Music classroom, stage, gymnasiums, uh, of course, administrative space, food service space. So this includes both your necessary space types in any school construction, uh, just from you know standard, you need an admin, you need your classrooms, you need your, your multi-purpose area but also some particulars that in discussion with stakeholders, they wanted to call out as critical basic for a 21st century school today in Wyoming. And so these are additive. There's the elementary space types uh, that, excuse me, the middle schools uh, also have with the exception of the kindergarten classroom. And the high schoolers have uh, uh, the, as a requirement those in the middle school uh, and so on and so forth. And so uh, the intent here, when we look through it, is which of these spaces uh, are relatively more important than others. And when looking at weighting of the score, we in the stakeholders, we came to the very simple conclusion that those spaces that house students for instruction were weighted more than those spaces that were used for um, auxiliary, uh, auxiliary courses or for support. So you can see here, the green arrow is, this is an educational learning space and therefore is weighted uh, as, a, as a one, if you will, gets its full value and an ancillary space gets half. And so uh, the idea in, in supporting the local role was another element and thread through our conversation. And so, whereas these are standard classrooms that based upon the experience we have uh, creating standards across the country and the, those uh, conversations that we had with the stakeholders in vetting which is appropriate at what level and why that a school district if they are using any classroom uh, that they want and they're calling it an art classroom that's fine it they have they have that value they get two-thirds of potential points there the remaining third of those points have to do with the requirements that we also vetted with the stakeholders, which was what are those key built environment features that support an art classroom that without which will impede general art instruction. For example, you need sinks, uh, utility sinks with clay traps in an art room that does 3D art. You need floor drains, you need hard services, uh, hardened services like work tables and those kinds of things. The standard student desk won't do. Uh, for uh, 2D, 3D art. And so we created a, a, what are the critical basic requirements within those spaces, which will be our subsequent slides. And you can see how those fit, fit together. If, uh, as Scott alluded to, a school district, for example, in this case says, uh, you know, we have one school in our district that centralizes our special education services. And therefore in this particular school, uh, we don't need a special education self-contained room because we have uh, that, that requirement fulfilled in an adjacent school. Then a school district is fulfilling the role and the intent of the standards and therefore is, does not get um, docked points for that. 
uh, because it, the, the role is being fulfilled. And so there is, uh, whereas this is a standards-based approach, there is a check and balance uh, that the local uh, building administrator, local district can, uh, can review and provide commentary to let us know if that's being requirements being fulfilled and by another means. So I'll David, I'll, there. Yeah, I'll go ahead and pause. And as you guys can see here, this is what we initially presented. And when you look at that, the, the ES on the, the left, the middle school and high school would include the spaces below and then additive to it would be those. And we proposed some standard weights, some, some weights that had more weight, weights that had less weight and how it evolved through the stakeholder meetings was what you saw here. And we thought that uh, in most part, anything that was an educational learning space or deemed an educational learning space had uh, equal weight and ancillary spaces to support the learning received less weight. Um, not to say they're not important, um, just had less weight compared to the educational learning spaces. They wanted to further break those up uh, from elementary and then middle and high school because there were some specific spaces that you would typically see present in a middle school, high school setting that may not be present in an elementary school. And so we can answer any questions at this point before we move on to the components that were identified for each classroom, uh, or we can go ahead and move on. Questions committee? I'm scrolling through here, but speak up if I'm not catching you. It uh, looks like we're in good shape for the time being, Scott. So please proceed. Or David, Thank whoever's you, Mr. Chairman. Proceed. Sure. So as David indicated here, uh, this is a sample of one of the space requirements. And when you look at this here, this, this block matrix we had for every single space. When you see a vacancy, for example, floors here, we're saying for this particular room, there is not a special requirement for a floor. As David said, for an art room, you may want a a floor surface that is hard and cleanable and not carpet. Um, and so that's where these were unique. Uh, we did these for every single space. And what we were looking at was to assess if these critical basics for each classroom were present. And if they were, great. If they weren't, they would be marked as a deficiency and then aggregated uh, across the campus. So David, if you want to right now talk about how that evolved and then we'll get into what it looks like globally with where we arrived. That'd be great. Sure. So those requirements, uh, the, the entire uh, process here in the stakeholder engagement was that we brought to the table uh, some initial recommendations, some initial concepts is more appropriate for the recommended space types and the requirements within. Those were vetted and commented on by the stakeholders in small groups. They reported them out in large groups at the end of the meeting. We took notes, we reflected on those notes, we made edits per those notes, we came back to the next meeting referencing the notes and the edits made and ask, okay, now, now what do you think with those edits? Excuse me. So that's, that is our, our process flow. And so it did evolve from the initial concept of space types and requirements as Scott, as Scott listed there. And we think of each of these space types essentially as a, as a, some space to address a program. So when we're talking about a high bay CTE, space, which is your, your larger 30 foot, 20 foot, 30 foot ceilings, or plus, uh, that is we use some kind of engineering and manufacturing. When we talk about low base CT in a high school, we're talking about uh, sort of more business classes and computer classes. So uh, the, uh, the intent uh, per the stakeholders was that these functions would be accounted for uh, in some kind of space. And then we outlined then what are the critical basic fixtures uh, and, and components of the space, the built environment that support it. Each of these filters that you see here, uh, each of these uh, requirements rather, are uh, built parts of the environment. We excluded all discussion of equipment that can move in and out that was portable, focusing only on the elements that are built, built in. So here's a matrix of, uh, that's a sample of how this li lines up globally. And how this is being applied is when we, we look at the AIMS database, which we've already done, I've already, uh, built in the standards to uh, ping the AIM database and look at uh, by, based upon the schools by grade level, what is the presence or absence of the space types as listed in, in this um, set of requirements or recommendations uh, relative to what you have presently. How does that, uh, those scores spread out across the grade levels? And then the intent is that on data collection, field verification would be to collect all of these data points uh, for each of the rooms, which 
doing this on the ground for a number of years, anticipate we're, we're talking th three to five minutes per classroom tops for data collection. And you collect all of this data for every room so that later on a district may choose to change the function of the room and can immediately uh, see exactly where the deficiency may be from a requirement standpoint because we inventory uh, each room for the different potential requirements and then the functions uh, can change as needed by the district. And so uh, how a score happens is you have your baseline, does the, the school have at least one of these space types to fulfill the function, yes or no? Uh, if yes, then they get that 0.67. And then the remaining points, if there are 10, sta you know, 10 standards uh, for, for the, that particular room, then we divide the remaining 0.33 points by 10. Uh, and, so you get, and so each of the individual requirements that they have get added that 0.3, that potential that those points that add up to uh, 0.33. So if they have five of the 10, they get half of the potential adequacy scores um, or what is it, 16 and a half percentage points on top of the 67. That is the score that they get for that particular room. And then those are all aggregated up by school uh, for all, all the different rooms to give you your school-wide score. Any questions for us before we move on? Mr. Chairman? Representative Summers, go ahead. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. So just quickly on this, um, would this, and maybe this is back to, to our people, but I'm sure you've discussed it. So the people that would be actually doing the scoring, is that the same team that does normal condition scoring in any school? So that would be the team that would run this, this assessment? Troy, maybe I would defer this to you. Our understanding, this is, this is uh, we're you know, certainly collecting it and intending this for field uh, study verification. And Troy, I'd let you answer that in terms of who would do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so we are looking at to uh, mobilize a single um, consultant to do condition assessment, educational adequacy, and, uh, and then of course this educational suitability rolls into it. So it is one, one consultant that we would uh, mobilize and have do all of them together. Uh, They're segmented in purpose and in, in uh, methodology while in the field, yet holistic in results. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. Further questions? I'm scrolling here. Senator Bebout, sorry I missed you there. No problem, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you know, when I look at uh, page 62, that's on the on the screen right now. Student student learning environmental score 50%. It seems to me that's the most subjective that you have of the of the four there that are listed, and yet it has such a high impact in terms of percentage. Could you talk a little bit more about that? That it is subjective, and so you know, definition of a student learning environment is pretty broad, depending on who wants to do it and how you do it. Maybe you could shine some light on that for me. Sure, I can take a crack at it, and then Scott, David or um, sort of Scott, either one. Yeah. Sure, I'll take a crack at it, Scott, and then you know finish it out. So, in discussions with the stakeholders, uh, the what they wanted to uh, emphasize uh, quite strongly was that uh, the state has done a, a very exemplary job on addressing building condition data statewide, and that's that's borne out in nationwide data, and that uh, the they wanted to really focus on equity in terms of the built environment and access to different learning spaces that the uh, teachers, the principals, and the, those who are in the committee uh, believe were foundational for us in modern teaching and learning. And so you, you are right. That is that a subjective in terms of prioritizing uh, one kind of space type and requirements with, uh, you know, over others. However, uh, it was built uh, with, with local feedback uh, around that driving question of what are the critical basic functions of a school and for in modern days today and how does that look in terms of space and the, the requirements uh, therein. 
the, the other measures, I would say that uh, the illumination, IAQ and tech, while they do have some quantifiable components, there are also um, process and subjective elements to them uh, necessary to that kind of uh, survey, because uh, these, these are survey plus data uh, verification exercises. And to expand upon that, yes, if you look at, at the, the four points right here, you can kind of see where that value proposition lied with the stakeholder group being that student learning environment had 50% weight followed by what they felt to be the next biggest impact on learning was indoor air quality. I think mm -hmm. that's what it came down to was this idea that they wanted to see what had the greatest impact on maximizing education and what they would have as their basics for having a student walk into a building and be well equipped to learn and function at a, a high level. And that's where they said, we feel the components of the classroom, if the cl classroom is available and present, and then it's properly equipped to deliver whatever that subject is, had the most weight, followed by the indoor air quality um, that's surrounding them to be able to learn. And then you can see here tech readiness and illumination is kind of where their value proposition landed. And then as David indicated, then backing into that and looking at, at data points that could be transferred from district to district across the state was the next task. Does that get to your, your question, sir? Yeah, it, it does partially. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. But, but when you look at that, it seems to me, and of course, Representative Freeman and Senator Wasserberger have way more experience in a classroom than I do. And to me, the, the most important part of that would be those that, that work in the classroom, and that's teachers. So what weight do they have? Uh, and you know, maybe you mentioned that and I missed it, but what weight do they have? And you know, it seems to me they should have be heavily weighted in terms of what is the learning environment when, they, when we look at it. And if we're gonna be subjective, we ought to be hearing from the teachers. Is that in fact the way we did it? If we did in terms of subject, subjectivity, what percent of impact did the, the teachers, those actually in the classroom have? Go ahead, David or Scott. Sure, so going, going back to that, when we first identified, um, when we presented, here's, here's what we think should be in a school by, by grade level. That's when they definitely had their input and we arrived at, this is collectively as a stakeholder group, what we feel for the state of Wyoming should be identified as the spaces. Then when we started to look, and we'll take that standard classroom there, a core classroom, we arrived at this table and they said, okay, for a core classroom, if you look at the top row there, we all collectively agree that these are the things that should be in that core classroom for a, an elementary school. As you can see, a sink is one there and a water fountain. They should have a, a toilet at the elementary level, which you don't see present at the higher grade level. And if you move on, you can see the other components that would be equipped in that particular space. And so that was the baseline to say, as a critical basic, here's the space we believe should be available in a, in a grade configuration. And then within that classroom, these are the things we think need to be in that room um, to deliver the, the model. And, and I had a great, you know, to give an analogy real quick, I went to a conference once about, um, spaces. And when we walked in, it was a conference room, which had tables, a projector, uh, writing utensils. And the presenter said, you know, everybody in here, if these things weren't present in the room, you would absolutely notice that they were not present. They're all here. You expect them to be here to, to deliver this conference and deliver it in the way that you, you would see fit. And so you notice when they're missing, um, but you don't so much when they're present. And so this was an attempt to say for a particular type of space, what needs to be in that space to maximize what it's delivering. And that's the data points that we collect here. And that, and just to, to, to follow up a little bit there, uh, Senator, uh, we did have teachers and principals involved in the stakeholder group that was intentional in the invitation. And so uh, we, we had uh, certainly listened to that voice and uh, sir, I don't have the, percentage breakdown of the committee right now that were teachers and principals, but I can get that information for you. Okay, proceed. Mr. Chairman. Representative Freeman, sorry I missed you. Um, kind of responding to Senator Bebout's uh, um, calling on 
One of the things that I think that uh, has always been missing in, in schools is a conference room that has um, um, privacy. What happens a lot in schools is, is that we go to an empty classroom and, and we have very sensitive meetings. I bet at least two dozen times I was in a, in a meeting where a parent is crying because of being told that her, her child, it was always a woman that was crying, um, uh, had learning difficulties. And, and in the middle of that, all of a sudden, in comes the students, not knowing what's going on. In my second, in my second mini career in education, um, I would talk to teachers and, and principals about trying to get students to uh, uh, take college classes. And what happened frequently was, again, we go to the classroom we sit down, we start to have the conversation, in comes the students because the bell rang. It seems like, you know, if you go into a business, if you go into the legislature, you have these spaces to where the private conversations can be held and completed without interruptions. I think schools would improve. I don't think, I think it's like a 2% on that thing, but if they can incorporate that into, into building it's, it's an important thing. So just kind of a, a out from left field, important uh, consideration. Further comments or questions? Not seeing any, uh, go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Scott Chairman. Or David, whoever. Sure. So you can see here, if you remember that, that hierarchy chart early on, we had these four data points here that rolled up to the one appropriateness of the student environment. That further then gets rolled up to the overall condition weighting. And so when you, you heard Troy earlier going out and assessing a school, they would like to assess the physical condition, the physical plant, the infrastructure, along with the appropriateness of the student environment to roll up to a, a total condition score. When Presenting this to the, the committee during the stakeholder meetings, there was an, a desire to weight these two. And, and you know, there was an obvious question, should they be weighted equal or should there be some that's heavily weighted more than others? And as David indicated, the committee uh, resoundingly said, our recommendation to the department and the greater committee here is that the appropriateness of the student environment receives 51%. And what they really were trying to say there is, this isn't that we necessarily think that this is more important than the physical plant. I think we'd all agree health safety is, is very important when you're in a school. But to acknowledge that the state over time has done a, a great job of addressing physical condition and really wanted to put an emphasis on the learning environment and the components that go into a school to further evolve this process to again, maximize the educational experience for Wyoming students. And so you can see here, that's where they arrived at a 51% score for the appropriateness, which to remind you is a composite of all of these data points here. Any questions on that? And if not, David, I will let you kind of close on our, our next steps and then we can answer any final questions. Certainly. So uh, what we've done, as mentioned, is we've taken the initial uh, recommendations and applied them to the aim in terms of uh, the presence or absence of space types, just to get an idea of, of how the initial scores spread. We've uh, posited some fake data for some schools just to test how uh, we can collect that data and display it so that you can, at the state level, see across uh, categorically by requirement, by space type, and then uh, you can see the sort of level of compliance uh, with, the, the, with the standards that way and, and get an idea of the sort of the, the individual build, build, building scores course as well. So we've measured all of these different uh, recommendations. We're putting them together into a, a sequence that can be replicated by any assessor who go into the field. So it's not in any sort of proprietary language or proprietary system. We're building it in Excel and Word documents uh, and we'll deliver here shortly a uh, how-to guide to assess, collect, and then analyze uh, the data all at one time.
And Mr. Chairman, that is all we have today. And we really do appreciate your time and everybody's time today. And, and again, would entertain any questions and, and more than happy to field me after the fact too. Questions, committee. I know we've asked some as we went, but are there some here in, at the end? Questions. All right. Well, Scott and David, thank you very much. Great information. Good work. Uh, please stay on the line here for a few more minutes as we will continue this conversation and may have a few questions come up. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good. Uh, Troy, anything you want to add? Mr. Chair, I think that um, the next presentation following this will will uh, bring in some harmony to where we're going. So um, we're ready to present that if you're willing and ready to move forward. Uh, yeah, go ahead and move forward. I don't see any questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'm on page 66 uh, of your booklet. And um, basically the, the committee has requested, you know, an update on educational suitability. Well, important part of that is the application of suitability. So how is this going to uh, end up in a, in a final uh, recommendations from the, uh, the school facilities commission? And uh, so, and this gets uh, somewhat complex and what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring it in a kind of a segmented portion at a time to the commission uh, and to the select committee in a way that makes sense, that fills in the spaces as we move forward through the process that is holistic and understanding of stakeholder involvement legislative uh, um, uh, interests, and obviously limitations on the amount of money that the state has to go forward with, uh, with uh, capital projects. So on page 466, we talk about uh, the state statute 2115-117, which uh, directly has to do with uh, condition, which involves this educational suitability uh, and other components within that, appropriateness of the student environment. Uh, but we're also responsible for uh, uniform adequacy standards in, in a broader spectrum that need to be brought into a building score, kind of like the, uh, um, you know, like our uh, condition list uh, index and like our capacity list that we're going to share later on with you uh, and prioritizations based on that historically. So uh, with that, we hired uh, FEA, Facility Engineering Associates. They are on with us today. Uh, and we'll introduce them in a moment. But we hired them for several reasons, uh, to develop a master matrix. So you can imagine after, uh, after stakeholder involvement, the complexities and all of the elements that are involved, and then you compare those to state statute, the requirements of state statute, what isn't required by state statute but permitted, and you start thinking about cost implications, um, a burden on districts for data, uh, providing data, accurate data, and the validation of data uh, collected out in the field. And uh, we have to put all this together in a way that makes sense, that is uh, a smart use of state funds uh, that um, abides by and fulfills state statutory requirements that the legislature set up within the statutes themselves. So we've worked with uh, FEA and we've done a tremendous amount of work I do want to point out that there were weights uh, that were presented um, and uh, subjective as they may be, they were captured and our stakeholders had voice, um, but those will eventually go before a commission to make a final choice. So what we're working through now is basically uh, developing the, um, the assessment as a whole, assessment tool, how we're going to measure uh, and we'll move forward with that. And the, uh, once the, the commission determines the appropriate weight for each factor or each element, uh, then, uh, then we as a department will edit the weighting within the database to reflect um, the commission's decision, or maybe there's, who knows, statutory requirements or something, whatever it is, we can actually program that within our database, integrate it into it, and we want to set it up in such a way that uh, it produces um, uh, good data uh, to make decisions on and based on reliable data uh, that involved uh, the legislature, the commission, the stakeholders, teachers, 
uh, our department in a way that um, honors all of those voices and yet leads to um, what the, the legislature would believe is is a fulfillment of that statute. So what Troy, are all I'm going done to, with that? Troy, I'm going to interrupt Go you. Uh, Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, Troy, and I, I kind of want to go back to a previous question I had. And, uh, and so as we build new schools today, and that we've just built new schools, have you have or have you now or will you run this matrix by what we're currently building to even see if we're building schools that are adequate? So, you know, we built a school two years ago, and now suddenly it doesn't have it doesn't meet adequacy on this particular on on suitability no fault of the legislature um maybe the fault of the school district because they didn't provide that how do we how are we going to mesh what we're building or currently building or have built in the last five years with this with this whole scoring process troy thank you Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so a, a couple answers to that in, in, uh, in, in reflection. We've talked a lot about this. Number one is when school districts, uh, we, we have buildings out there that are probably still in 1940s, 50s. I think we've replaced most of them before then. We've got buildings that, that as the educational program has been defined uh, through the state of Wyoming, uh, those educational needs uh, and the decisions by which to make, uh, to, to use spaces within districts have always been uh, within the purview and the responsibility of the districts to make. Um, our, our design guidelines have never made mandatory that you have to have a, uh, a um, gym or you have to have a, uh, a music room or whatever. It does say that you have to meet the uh, commission approved capacity for educational space. Um, so there's not really that mandatory requirement, and we're already seeing that just because standards or a, me uh, a metrics uh, of, of a matrix of measurement is established does not require us or demand that a school district have to have a certain space, neither does it deny them to have a different space. So there, I think that there's a lot of flexibility moving forward. What it does say is, that the with the uh, participation of the commission, select committee, stakeholders, school districts, et cetera, um, they are looking at the 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 basics of of what they think an educational environment should have if it has a space, and does that space have those basics within it? The purpose of the assessment then is is not to make mandatory those things that it identifies, but rather to measure those things when present. Uh, how effective are they? Are they present in order to facilitate a, an appropriate educational environment? Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. Um, Mr. Chairman, thank you. So, so Troy, I'm not sure that I got all of that and I'm not sure that that makes sense from a practical standpoint. Um, and still it gets to me to this question of what have we built in the last five years are they now not going to meet condition because of that's how they were built? Are we going to move forward in the future building buildings that are going to, that 51%, you know, 51% of the condition score is based upon this. And if these buildings are not being mandated to be built this way, then they automatically, you know, flop down in condition score and we, and they could be up prematurely. Um, so I guess it's not, uh, you know, there's nothing, nothing's in stone yet, but I think you have to ask yourself, and I think the commission has to ask itself, what, what have we built in the last five years, and what are we going to build, and how does all of this flow together? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to reply. Uh, so, uh, yes, I think that we and we talked about this this week internally. The fact is that new buildings, depending on um, depending on design uh, of certain spaces chosen by a district, 
uh, can uh, have deficiencies uh, compared to the standards because of choices within that building for design or use. So uh, not all buildings are uh, equal, not all school districts are equal, not all uh, the way that each, each uh, for instance, from one administrator to the next, and what they choose to put in that building, how they choose to educate those students will vary from even administration to administration, teacher to teacher. Uh, and, so, and so there is the identifiable um, deficiencies, even in new buildings, uh, based on stakeholder involvement and decisions made uh, in, in what elements will be measured uh, and certain degrees by which those will be valued. So uh, there's no doubt about that new buildings will have uh, identifiable deficiencies according to stakeholder uh, input and values. Uh, and no new building is perfect, neither in condition or in educational suitability. And so there's a variability within the assessment that will measure that. Representative Summers, does that help answer your question? Um, Mr. Chairman, it does. Um, I think it really begs the question. You can't build deficient buildings new. We, you, you, it just, the, this has got to be rectified before you move on, or at least in my mind it does, because it, it makes no sense that you're going to start devaluing a school as it's being built. And, and so if, if this, maybe we have to make standards and, or maybe we see if we can loosen this whole thing up because it seems, um, yeah, anyway, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'll leave it alone, but it's a scab that I'm probably gonna keep picking for a while. Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess my question follows along Representative Summers is, is that as you, uh, in other types of buildings, for example, in Wyoming on our long-term care facilities, we have built in a way to re-age the building depending on major maintenance uh, uh, and um, refurbishing that they do to the building, it re-ages it to a point. And so uh, with all we're doing to our buildings, do we keep them, do we, do we show that they're aging out prematurely or as we do these uh, major maintenance and, and additions to them the, and updates to them, do we re-age the building? Troy? Mr. Chairman, they're, they're re-aged with regard to facility condition uh, scoring. So uh, those, each, of, each of the systems within the building is is revalued, looked at what kind of major maintenance, what kind of capital investment has occurred within those systems. And they are re-aged with regard to condition. We don't like redate buildings. We acknowledge that there could be four or five different renovations, additions, and so on. A building's origin is a building's origin in its original date. But the, the aging comes on really, or, or if you want to value that age, uh, you have to take into account the improvements uh, holistically that have taken place over in, in that building from one assessment to the other. And that's why uh, we've, we've striven, not, not statutorily required, but certainly striven to do an every four-year type of uh, assessment on those for condition uh, to relook at that, to see what those capital and major maintenance investments have been and what impact they have on the condition. Thank you. Further questions? All right, seeing none, Troy, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On the bottom of page 66, I think this is a really, and, and thank you so much for the questions. We really appreciate it uh, because uh, we want to inform the, the select committee and the commission as best as possible and the stakeholders that we move forward. On the bottom of that page 66 is milestones. And so I wanted to point out that uh, we want to do this in such a way that is over time. Uh, I told you that it's segmentable uh, and that brings, brings uh, great points like have been brought today uh, to our attention uh, so that we can work with the commission, the select committee, and other stakeholders across the state, our consultants, to answer those questions and to bring back uh, clear, hopefully definitive answers, uh, and uh, also to present challenges that may be uh, um, that may 
through input from specifically the select committee or other bodies may may help the commission make the best decisions. So uh, looking at those milestones, uh, you can look at it in a chronological way, which I presented uh, to the commission last week, or you can look at it uh, uh, by uh, a categorical way. For instance, August 27th, we, we met with our commission and presented this pre same presentation to them as an introduction. Today, we're, we're meeting with you as a select committee. But if you follow it through categorically, the, we're going to uh, work with the commission on August 27th, September 16th. We're going to come back November 4th, and then we're going to ask them in December to make a final decision of what this methodology looks like for a bu building uh, score with everybody's input and wrestling with all those concepts. Notice it's a select committee. We're meeting with you uh, today and then plan, uh, and if the committee so desires it, to report back on this the October 22nd with you to fit into your time schedule. And then notice that we want to, on September 22nd, to bring in stakeholders across the state, educational stakeholders, and anybody else that wants to be uh, involved and present at least where we, we're at after the first three meetings. And then down on October 27th, the Governing Documents Committee, I mentioned that earlier, we have a Government's Document Committee, which is made up of uh, basically uh, four uh, superintendents that represent the four regions of the state or quarters of the state, give or take, and uh, uh, WDE and, uh, and uh, other entities like that. Uh, and then on page 67, uh, obviously, uh, on November 5th through 30th, we have to test the scoring methodology. So whatever decisions are made, whatever those decisions are, whatever the values are, whatever the weights are, we're going to go test that go out in the field, see what it looks like, get an experience, and see if there's any other tweaks that need to occur before we come back for a, a decision from the commission at their fourth meeting that they're going to be exposed to this four times. Uh, and then uh, what we want to do, of course, is bring up hot topics such as, you know, what do we do with new buildings? What impact can a new building have a deficiency uh, based upon uh, whatever the rubric may be? Uh, and answer those kind of questions. At any rate, we hope that uh, we can get this going by December. Uh, and then uh, actually we wanna follow that once those decisions have been finalized and made, obviously we wanna update rules and regs of the commission and have them weigh in on that so that it represents the values or decisions made along the way. And then of course, go through that rulemaking process. So that's kind of the timetable that we wanna present in, a, in kind of a flow of, of just continuing to engage stakeholders, whoever they are, and, and developing this as we go and addressing issues as they come up and getting decisions in a timely manner that lead to good decisions that represent and support the requirements of state statute. Uh, and then we do have a presentation. Troy, I'm going to interrupt this, you. Troy, I'm going to interrupt you. Representative Summers, please. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Troy? You know, as I think about this, you know, one thing I think you need to build into your rubric some in some manner is individual choice by districts. And ultimately, if we live, if we leave uh, responsibility to districts to decide how to create their space within a within you know within the statutes, right? We have statutory requirements for for some of that. Um, then there has to be uh, part, as part of the rubric, their decision on what is appropriate space has to be weighed. In other words, even if you have all of these things listed out in the rubric as, as meeting or not meeting some suitability requirement, ultimately it comes down to what did the district do and how did they choose to do that? They are the <laughs> ultimate deciders unless we have to build unless you come back to us and say, legislature, you need to build into statute or we need to build into rule that they have to follow all of these things. And if you don't build that in as standards, then you have to have in your rubric, the assumption that districts are making that decision on suitability and you build it into the rubric. Thank you, we've noted that and we'll take that into account. Okay, Troy, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with us then is uh, Bill Small uh, from FEA, Facility Engineering Associates, and John Edwards. And uh, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, we'll hand this uh, presentation over to them. And 
I think they have probably the same uh, uh, request, and that is I think it's John Edwards is going to lead, lead the presentation, and if he uh, could have control of the screen, I, I think that would be great. All right. I think he should be able to do that. And uh, so go ahead, uh, Mr. Edwards, and proceed. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, Bill Small and John Edwards from Facility Engineering Associates, and we thank the committee for, or excuse me, the uh, excuse me, thank the committee for the opportunity to present this information today about the topic of the Composite Facility Index. And the purpose of this presentation is to give that initial overview that Troy mentioned that we are in the very early stages of developing uh, the the elements of the, the composite facility index. So we want to give a broad overview and talk about the status of the work. And of course, uh, welcome questions and take other input as we proceed with uh, the development of this concept of a composite facility index. So this is uh, page 69 of 78 in your packet it, it, for those who may not be able to follow on the screen. So the, the concept of the composite facility index or CFI it's intended to accomplish the purposes of what today in state statutes called the building condition score. And that building, overall building condition score as described is, is intended to provide an objective means to prioritize remedies. And those remedies include a lot of things and many of them have been discussed today. There are capacity remedies, there are condition, actual hard condition remedies, there are suitability remedies. And so being able to not only look at each of those types of challenges that buildings may have on an individual basis of a condition or a capacity challenge, but to also aggregate those scores into an overall composite facility index so that then buildings can be prioritized on a statewide basis. Of course, all of this is intended to bring all buildings and facilities to a condition and over time only I really have to worry about routine maintenance. That's the dream of all facility portfolios and that's where this is uh, moving. But of course, all these are subject to, to available funding as the remedies are prioritized. But the condition, the composite facility index that I'll be describing today is the work that we are working with the state on to prepare how to evaluate and score many things we've talked today and talked about so far today. And I will attempt to bring those together and show how they're going to relate one another. So the baseline for which all of the assessments that have been talked about today will fall is under the umbrella of the uniform adequacy standards. And so the uniform adequacy standards describe the entire universe of how facilities support the delivery of the required statewide educational program. And within those uniform adequacy standards, there are items that are somewhat descriptive in terms of they just explain a point or talk about a procedure. But then many of the uniform adequacy standards themselves are specific requirements or specific standards and most of them are also measurable in some way. So within the idea of a composite facility index, it will be those items that are within the uniform adequacy standards that can and will be assessed to generate this composite facility index. Just a couple of examples of, of items that, that you know, we can be assessed and recorded in the state database, but not necessarily count towards a composite facility index that uh, is going to be calculated at the end of this process might be something like a non, non education related building. So non education related buildings, non student related buildings um, aren't considered for the scoring matrix because they don't necessarily contribute to the delivery of the educational program. But because of state, certain parts of state statute, they are required to be assessed for condition. They are required to be assessed for adequacy. So they, they will be assessed and recorded in the database that's going to capture, the AIM database is going to capture all of the elements of this adequacy assessment and the processes that will be developed over time. But not necessarily all of them will go into the calculation of the composite facility index. And I'll talk about that calculation a little more here in just a second. But right now, I'm kind of walking through how we are building the idea of developing the assessments and the different type of assessments. 
So within the realm of educational, or excuse me, adequacy assessments, there are some items for which there are already clear definitions and standards of not only what the adequacy standards are, but also how to measure those and how they, those will be rated. One example of that is capacity. So within the, ad, within the uniform adequacy standards and those items to be assessed under this uh, TAN bubble, a subset of those are specifically capacity related. I believe there is another discussion on, on your agenda today that talks about capacity and capacity formulas, uh, but whatever the outcomes are of the decisions made about how capacity will be determined and how it will be rated, there, those elements will be part of an overall assessment process of educational adequacy and the composite facility index. A second piece that makes up part of this overall composite facility index and falls within the realm of the uniform adequacy standards is the topic that was presented just prior to this about building condition. This darker green bubble represents the elements of building condition, half of which, uh, roughly half of which is the actual physical plant condition. And all those elements of physical plant condition are included in the adequacy standards and are going to be considered as part of this overall assessment process. Then there's the suitability piece of condition, which was also talked about. And almost all of those are within the realm of the uniform adequacy standards and this overall adequacy assessment. There are a, a slight few number of items which are part of the educational suitability assessment, which don't fall within the uniform adequacy standards as defined today. A couple specific examples are some, some of those specific elements of the classroom illumination, for example, the, the adequacy standards don't detail it by number, uh, what each type of classroom, but there is you know, discussion about making sure the classrooms do have, they, that they are outfitted properly. So it's more in the, some of the details and the specifics are just slightly outside the uniform adequacy standards. But in any event, capacity in this bubble and facility condition collectively, which is condition and suitability collectively, are going to be two of the three elements that make up the overall educational adequacy assessment. The remainder, what's not covered by one of these other two bubbles, are items which will have to be captured in some way and will have to be recorded in the AIM database to show how, how a school is or is not meeting the uniform, uniform adequacy standards. And so that's the third component. And this is the one that's under most development right now is what are those items that fall outside the realm of capacity or condition as defined that also need to be assessed and how will they be assessed? And so if you think about the process by which to keep all of this straight, because there's a lot of moving parts there's a lot of specific definitions. There's items that exist. There are items like suitability that was just talked about that are still under development. Uh, we wanted to make sure we had the ability to keep up and keep track of all these items. And so we have been working with the state internally on our methodology to organize every element of the uniform adequacy standards and address these three questions. For the elements that are in the uniform adequacy standards, what does state statute require to be assessed based on existing state statutes? The second question is for the elements that are in the uniform adequacy standards, which ones are not required to be assessed by state statute, but the state is choosing to assess them anyway in order to help generate a prioritization of potential remedies. And then for all the items that are being assessed, which of them will actually go into the CFI calculation? the composite facility index calculation, that rubric that we talked about. So uh, just, just to clarify, every, every item is going to be assessed if it's part of the uniform adequacy standards and it is assessable, but not every item that is assessed necessarily counts into the scoring. Uh, for example, the, if you think about the, the acreage at a site of a school, uh, if, if you know, the minimums, if the adequacy standard says it's going to be four acres and a, a school was built on a 3.8 acre site, we will record that in the database. That will be noted as an assessment item that it doesn't meet the standard and that it is uh, noted in the database uh, 
but I, I would expect, again, all these decisions are, are subject to commission and committee approval in the end, but I would expect something like that. It, you would not say, okay, therefore, that school is lacking in adequacy because of that 0.2 acres, unless it somehow otherwise impacts the educational program. We're not going to generate a remedy to go find another 0.2 acres for that school to be cited on. So there are elements of the adequacy standard that, that will be count, counted. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt, but just for a moment, I, I'd like to just have you pause. Uh, that's a lot of information thus far, and I, I want to give the, the committee an opportunity to jump in if if there are any questions to this point. Um, not all of you are on my screen, but uh, but please jump jump in there if you do have a question for Mr. Edwards thus far. Okay, thank you for letting me do that. Mr. Edwards, please continue. Mr. Vice Chairman, thank you. So in keeping, keeping our scorecard, if you will, of all these things is, has been part of the process that we've been working very closely with the state on in identifying all these elements. And I think this illustration, which for you is on pa page 75 of 78 of your packet, may best illustrate how all these pieces are gonna come together. So if you look at the top of the drawing here, we have a composite facility index which is the subject of this presentation and where the state is ultimately headed, that, that, sco that numerical score that will represent the idea of the build, what's today called the building condition score that aggregates all the various aspects of educational adequacy, suitability and condition into a single number. And it'll be made up of multiple subcomponents. Uh, if you look down at the bottom of the drawing, the four sub-elements, which are, are hard to read on the screen and maybe a little more readable in your packet, but these are the four elements that were presented in the prior presentation. So those have a methodology that's under development, a weighting that has been proposed and, and vetted through stakeholders and is under consideration, and, and those elements and what's included in those elements and how they are to be scored are part of this overall composite facility index. These four roll up to the educational suitability piece, and then the educational suitability piece is added to the plant condition piece or the physical condition, facility condition piece to get that condition score. This was that dark green bubble on the Venn diagram that was at the beginning of the diagram. So you've got elements of condition, then there's separate processes for overall building capacity at the gross level. And again, those are well-defined processes today. Those were shown as a gray bubble on that Venn diagram. So they make up part of the uniform adequacy standards. And then that leftover space that I talked about in the Venn diagram of items that can and should be assessed and may be included also in terms of scoring are defined by this third bubble, the educational adequacy bubble. So every building will have a condition score, a capacity score, an educational adequacy score, and then a composite facility index. Mr. And that's Chairman? the intent. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll pause. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Edwards, I wanted to follow up on the, on the aggregation concept and, and rolling things up. And over the years in, in, on this committee and on, on other committees related to education, one of the problems we've run into is the idea that aggregation of these types of factors can end up shielding critical problems effectively, which is one of the reasons why we, for example, require that schools address, uh, you know, poor components and, and other such things that are, that are identified as critical aspects, even if the overall composite isn't the problem. And, and a few years ago, we actually decoupled capacity from educational adequacy because we recognized that, uh, you know, if you're horrible on one, but you're good on the other, everything looks okay when you average the two out. So as I'm seeing the idea that we're going to roll up the entirety of the suitability into kind of one score, I, I have that concern once again that, you know, it'll be, it'll be perfect technology, great lighting, incredible airflow, all because the room doesn't have a roof. Uh, right? So you put it all together, it's a great score overall, uh, but it, it kind of forgets the fact that a roof is an essential component. Um, how are we going to avoid the fact that an averaging that takes place anytime you roll 
a variety of indicators into one overall composite indicator uh, doesn't end up hiding critical flaws when those are essential to address and, and that they're not hidden due to that averaging factor, Mr. Edwards. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Edwards. Uh, Mr. Chairman I'll, I'll, I'll start and I'll, of course I'll defer. Actually, I, I'd rather defer to Troy first and then I'll follow up with that, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Troy. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you. Um, so to, to answer that is, is I think that number one is we have varying um, pots of money, uh, varying funds that are resources to address things along the way. We do have major maintenance that, as you mentioned, that, uh, that can be used for low condition scores. We do have component funding that can um, address those larger things that major maintenance may not necessarily may be deficient on with regard to the amount of major maintenance it takes to replace something that's very much larger than the ability for major maintenance to cover. So, so I think that's one answer uh, to your question. Um, I think the, the uh, other answer is the simple fact that condition capacity educational um, uh, educational adequacy in this, which state state statute leads to this kind of a flow up to a, a, a composite facility index, we're calling it, choosing to call it. But the, um, the committee and the select committee specifically in the past has given direction. Um, we have, we have responsibilities to abide by your state statute and, and that's what we're striving to do here, but that doesn't limit the select committee by, um, and hasn't in the past saying, Hey, Give us that condition list also. Give us the capacity list also. We can have an educational adequacy list also that rolls up into the composite facility index. And so there can be these smaller segments of the assessment piece that are valued, but yet, uh, but yet are ranked in an index in such a way that allows the select committee or the commission to, to say, hey, based on this, recommendations could be made on these smaller segmented uh, uh, portions that make up the composite facility index as a whole. Um, so that's kind of earlier this week, we were talking about uh, the, the uh, uh, quality air quality and, and how could uh, uh, in the past uh, air conditioning was actually presented for some of the committee members who were there Long ago, uh, there was a recommendation of, of how much it would it cost to put AC in all the buildings across the state. Um, those kinds of requests can be made. They take additional work uh, in order to look at and evaluate and give recommendations. But I, I, I do believe that the select committee has the freedom to ask for those uh, segmented lists and to make decisions based on those. So, so I don't think our intention is to give you the composite facility index in and of itself by itself. Uh, although we can do that, and that's what state statute kind of leads to the conclusion, but we can certainly be responsive to uh, committee needs and desires along the way. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Follow up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Then, Troy, I appreciate that. And, I, and I'll just say then that let's make sure that we are seeing it that way and that a, as we look at the condition score um, and, and the, the – uh, um, educational suitability score uh, that we're continuing to contemplate that disaggregated subscore and recognize that if there are critical component failures, that those are you know, still showing up in red for educational suitability, just like they show up in red uh, for condition score when we're, we're doing those evaluations and that those are coming to our attention. So thank you, Troy, for that explanation. Further questions? Mr. Chairman, this is Bill Small at FDA. May I offer another comment? Absolutely, Mr. Small, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, Bill Small, FDA, um, president of FDA. I've been working with John in the state on the development of this CFI. Um, to Senator Rothfuss's question, the, the data at the granular level will all be collected and stored in AIM. So our ability to report on individual items uh, does not go away. Uh, so the ability to pull something to see to see items that are that that should potentially be flagged for concern or attention 
will always be able to be pulled out of AIM. So we're doing that very deliberately. And that is, that is part of our, our engagement is to make sure that all of this data gets into AIM and is reportable. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Representative Summers. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Could I get just a few examples of uh, the education adequacy bubble and what makes it up? Anyone want to take John, a stab at that? Yeah, thank you, John. You have our matrix. If you could bring that up and identify those things that go under yeah. the educational adequacy by themselves. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm, I'm calling that up right now. While you're doing that, I would offer, as I look at this uh, drawing on page 75, condition, capacity, and adequacy, to me, the suitability should replace, replace adequacy. And the reason I say that is because that's those are the items we discuss in statute. And I don't know uh, if the commission or if the consultants or how educational adequacy became a new uh, co-equal part of this 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 score and so to me that's where suitability falls in uh and then the the subtopics under suitability of how to, to to drive that because adequacy and suitability to me are one and the same and so i guess i'm still struggling to track how educational adequacy has now became part of this discussion and suitability has been bumped down lower when educational adequacy really isn't discuss near like condition capacity and suitability are in, in, in statute. So again, I, I might just be slow here, but I'm, I'm not picking up on how that, how or why that became part of this discussion. Mr. Chairman, this is Troy Decker. Go ahead, Troy. Uh, so I think that the two statutes that we've looked at that are really driving this, this distinctive uh, clarification between the two is you've got 2115-117 that talks about condition, and it specifically talks about educational suitability, appropriateness of student environment under the condition statute. And then you have the educational adequacy statute, which is uniform adequacy standards that is identified and has unique traits under 2115-115. And so uh, as we struggled with this to conceptually, and that's why we put it in a bubble diagram to conceptually understand is, that the requirements of 20, there are requirements of 2115-115 that do not fit under uh, the 2115-117 um, uh, requirements or identif uh, identifiable criteria to be weighed within this, this uh, total um, composite facility index. So that's where we, we uh, struggled, but that's what we conclusion we came to with regard to state statute and that the educational adequacy does have unique attributes that are not that that are, are somewhat intertwined that can be crossed over with educational suitability, but uh, in in other ways are unique in and of themselves that must be attributed to uh, an overall uh, score for a building. Okay, I'll, I'll process and digest that for a moment. Representative Summers. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thanks. Follow up. So. That goes back to my question, what is in education, educational adequacy that's not in the other buckets? Troy? Uh, Troy, Mr. Chairman, sorry, I, I, I have the information, Troy, if you'd like me to provide that answer. Please, thank you, proceed. Okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And to the representative's question. So that was part of that ana analytical piece I talked about of this matrix of keeping a scorecard. Some examples include uh, having access to parking for staff, students, and visitors that enables the school to deliver the required statewide educational program. So that's a specific element in the educational adequacy standards that's not part of educational suitability and the built learning and the learning environment itself. Another, have separate areas for bus loading and unloading and student pickup and drop off. 
Another is be accessible to emergency vehicles. So those are three site related examples that are in the adequacy standards uh, that aren't necessarily covered by suitability. I'm looking for a few others here. So another is having a gymnasium with a basic scoreboard capable of tracking score, time, and period is, a, is actually a statutory requirement to be assessed, um, among other things, with respect to middle schools. So there are a number of items which, through this process of examining every element of the uni, uni, um, uniform adequacy standards, that's been our discussion with the state. Is this already assessed somewhere else? Is this assessed through a capacity process? Is this assessed through a physical plant condition process? Is this assessed already by educational suitability? And if so, that adequacy standard can be met by those, those types of assessment. That was the Venn diagram that showed the bubbles that were inside that larger uniform adequacy standards. So then to, to the representative's question, everything that was outside of those two bubbles or anything that aren't being already assessed somewhere or data that has to be collected and recorded in the AIM database somewhere to develop an overall all education, educational adequacy subscore as part of the a, a composite facility index. And then uh, Mr. Chairman, follow up. A, yeah, just Mr. Chairman, just a quick follow up. I think in one of your diagrams and maybe it's coming up, you give um, education suitability of 15% ranking. So when you get to that piece of your presentation, please explain why you give each ranking, you know, go through your ranking in detail. Yes. Mr. Chair, this is Troy. May I uh, uh, bring in 2115? Just kind of identify some of the requirements 2115, 115. Would that help? Go ahead if you'd like, Troy. Sure. So 2115, the commission shall by rule and regulation establish, maintain uniform adequacy or statewide standards for the adequacy of school buildings, facilities necessary, providing educational programs described by state law for the public school, schools. They need to be uniform. Uh, requirements for educating students in a safe environment, including all applicable building, health, safety, and environmental codes, and standards required by law for all public buildings building site requirements, building performance standards and guidelines, uh, including energy efficiency criteria, uh, assurances for the spe uh, uh, special needs of identified student populations, including tr tr children with disabilities, guidelines for adequacy and functionality of educational space for required educational programs, building space criteria aligned with the prescribed state educational program with consideration given the utilization differences, between school sizes and school levels. We talked about that earlier today. Technology capacity criteria sufficient to meet required educational program needs, building and facility accessibility. Uh, department shall maintain a comprehensive uh, statewide database. Um, the condition of the building, seismic, uh, this is one we're gonna be talking about you later on, uh, probably in October, if that's your desire, the condition of school buildings, facilities, seismic ratings and structural integrity. Uh, of school, school building component and systems rated as excellent, good, fair, and poor. Fair, fair and poor. Um, uh, school building and facility longevity and space requirements, student educational and safety requirements, the ability to accommodate educational technology, site requirements of school buildings and facilities, inventory of exterior and interior building and facility space, uh, and then it tells us that we need to review this every four years. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, just to, to, again, looking at this, a lot of these, uh, these do not fall directly under educational suitability or are, are, are somewhat segmented from the 2115-117 statute as well uh, that specifically has to do with condition and everything under it. Okay, Mr. Edwards, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So to, to the question of the, the slide and the percentages, I, I can clarify. So the composite facility index that was illustrated on the previous slide is made up of three sub elements. And for that, in order to get a composite score, we will expect in the future to have to provide a weighting for that. Uh, we, we have not determined what those percentages should be, and we're not making a recommendation today that these should be the percentages. What, what we are illustrating here, though, is that the existing 
rules and regulations in chapter eight, which is where the building condition score, as it's called today, does define these weights. It said the building condition score should be 50% condition, 35% capacity, and 15% in what that part of the, the rules calls educational suitability. Um, as we've prepared this concept of a composite facility index to address the, the idea of that rolled up score of multiple components, we have gotten away from using the term educational suitability at this level because of the 117 statute that Troy mentions that it determined, it has determined that educational suitability is this 51% of the pie that was talked about earlier today. Um, so we've, we've used educational adequacy as the third element because that's the assessment of the uniform adequacy standards that aren't capacity related or aren't building condition related. The, the 15, 35, 50 here is, is purely just to show that they will, there will be some sort of distribution. We do not, uh, we're not proposing that today. And then whatever proportion that condition does make up of the overall composite facility index uh, will, will reflect the outcomes of the earlier discussion today about the elements that make up that condition score. There was a, a, another point made earlier too about uh, when you start rolling up and aggregating this data to this level, the critical items can be masked. And that's absolutely true if this were the, the only number to be looked at. Uh, in addition to what Troy said, which is that we will still be able to provide, uh, we and the state will still be able to gather individual pieces of information either about condition collectively or even down to the building system level condition uh, data will be available within the AIM database. Uh, th there is also the possibility that as we work through this process with the, the committee and with the commission and with the state, that if there are items that are identified that are so critical to the delivery of the educational program that it's, it's a fail safe, in other words, you, you have to have this or it's all stop immediately, then there, there, there may be a way within the assessment process and within the rubric to flag those kind of issues so that no matter how small they might be on a percentage basis, they're, they're critical to delivery and, and without them, the whole school fails. Um, so if, if those kind of elements are known and are identified and we are able to work that, that may be another way of addressing the issue of not having a component uh, get lost in the muddle of all the numbers. But again, this, this is intended to illustrate that for on the previous diagram where we were just trying to show relationally how the components fit together, how that earlier discussion of educational suitability rolls up into a higher level score. This is an illustration of the same concept, except using some, some percentages that in the future will be determined to, 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 to uh, calculate the composite facility index. Mr. Chairman, I'll pause there. Mr. Chairman. Representative Summers, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I know I don't know if this is for uh, the commission or for for Mr. Edwards, but as as obviously somebody's going to have to do this work. So we hire a consultant to go out and do this work. How do I know, as a legislator, as as somebody that's looking at the people's money, that we're not creating a assessment? Um, an assessment tool that is going to cost the state 50% more than the current assessment tool. So, you know, there's also the cost of the assessment. And, and uh, what I don't want to do is create a, an assessment tool that's going to cost us three times the money that the current assessment tool does, even though it, the current one doesn't address all these factors what is going to be the cost of this assessment tool and that should be a part of the information that we see going forward i think adding on to that thought is we have a current assessment tool and if we implement this one we will be reshuffling our list of where schools are prioritized on lists and and every time we create a new assessment or a new way of assessing these issues we, we shuffle the deck again and some folks are winners and some folks are losers. And I really don't want to see us shuffling the deck every four years. I like to see the, the uh, assessment be the same so that we know if we're gaining or, or, 
or not in terms of improving our schools instead of know that we're gaining or losing because we've re we have, have created a new way of assessing what's going on. I think in this assessment, the, the one thing that gets added is the suitability factor that hasn't been addressed in previous years. And so uh, I think Representative Summers is spot on when, when he says, is this assessment going to create a, a large cost to the state? And, and we really don't know if we've gained over what we did previously. So that's just my thoughts. Further comments, uh, Senator Roth, sorry, I'm scrolling through trying to catch everyone. Senator no, Roth. I understand. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on what you were saying because it's a, it's a good point that we, uh, you know, we haven't always done a great job with the uh, reshuffling over the years of, uh, of what the lists look like when we change the parameters or, or do a new assessment. And um, that is something that I think we certainly can incorporate new components and and new ways of looking at suitability for example as we're looking at this condition score we can have the overall composite but it gets back to making sure that we're uh, continuing to look at the condition score by itself and and that was the factor we were looking at before right so let's keep that list let's not throw that list out let's keep looking at it uh, let's make sure we're looking at the condition score list and looking at the suitability score list basically separately and if we want to roll them up into one additive number that's fine too but as long as we maintain the previous algorithms in place and we can compare that i think we'll be able to reflect through time and then the other thing that we have to commit to which hasn't been done in the past but it, it's largely up to this committee to take a look at is to not reshuffle under any circumstance let's say the last 20 highest rated projects that are in queue. Let's not do that again, right? We and and that's that's something that we can control in terms of prioritization. So uh, don't allow the top ones, the ones that are planning in the near term, to have some type of remedy in place, whether that's through a component or whether that's through uh, whether that's through a new building, whether that's through a new wing, whatever the case may be. Uh, I think it's beholden on us as the committee that sets the budget to not allow those recent projects that are already in queue to be shuffled uh, so that we, we have some continuity. I don't know how far down on the list you go. I don't know how we do that, but we, we've failed in that in the past, uh, and that is up to us. So I, I think good wisdom there, Chairman Walters. I appreciate those thoughts. Once again, I'm scrolling, looking for hands. Oh, there's one. Uh, Co-Chairman Landon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I, I appreciate uh, all the comments made uh, very well stated. I, I might just add to what Senator Rothfuss uh, has reminded us. And uh, while I agree with him, sometimes what we take forward out of our select committee uh, isn't necessarily what happens by the end of February. And, uh, and so, you know, I would just encourage our select committee to, uh, you know, remember that and to stand fairly united. You might remember in the state Senate, uh, Senator, how I tried to re remind everyone, there's a reason why we try to stick with the list that is broad, because it can be political Armageddon if we don't. And we have run into times in the past where we have lifted uh, specific uh, politically desired projects uh, well above those that we knew darn well deserved to be at the front of the list. And so, um, you know, I agree with everything that's been stated. I think, I think the positive in all of this, and I commend John and all of your troops for, uh, for helping us to understand what suitability is. I think I think we have it in statute, and so it's imperative that we get our arms around what exactly is this, and so that's a good thing. Uh, but really appreciate the fact that hey, let's let's make sure that we that we're able to separate out what we've always been able to see in the past, and um, and then I think we can be okay. Um, I just don't want this suitability piece to to be a want driver. I have the same heartburn that my good friend from Pinedale has, and that is, 
you know, let's be careful that we don't, uh, you know, double the list of wants out there. Uh, so just those thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, further questions? John, do you wanna to proceed to the last page of your presentation or offer any thoughts as we go? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So to summarize uh, the process, as, as Troy mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, where at the very early steps, there'll be multiple opportunities engagement. But to quickly summarize, from a building condition standpoint, as was noted, there's a methodology that's in place and has served the state well. and uh, the educational suitability portion of condition is under development as was described earlier. The capacity methodology is established and the educational adequacy methodology, which are those remaining pieces, are part of the effort that FEA is assisting the department with on developing what the assessment like, might look like. I, I will note to the concern about uh, how, how much data has to be collected and so forth, not necessarily every item that gets assessed will require a consultant or a, a, a paid person to go out into the field to look at it. There are other tools that we're discussing with the state on which items might be able to be captured by surveys or data from existing state databases that already have the information. So anywhere there's an opportunity to use a reliable data source that doesn't require a person to physically go verify, I believe the state's intent is to, the, the department's intent at least is to take advantage of those um, and, and only physically assess in person those items which, which must be assessed in that manner because that's the way you would have to understand it. So um, I, th I think that's part of this overall process of figuring out not only what needs to be assessed, but how is it going to be assessed? And so I, I'm sure all the comments that were made today, the, the state, the department will take into consideration. The, the, the final component of, of what's been done to date is that analysis of the uniform adequacy standards that I talked about in the line by line review, which has pointed out where the gaps are that a, a, a particular part of the statute requires an assessment that isn't necessarily being captured and recorded in the database today. The, the next steps, it will be continued progress on the educational suitability portion that was talked about by cooperative strategies and the department. And then the development of the methodology for the adequacy piece, FEA will be working on that. And then we'll be working with the department on how to develop that algorithm uh, and both have the overall CFI that very much mirrors what's defined in state statute today as the building condition score but then also how to make sure that those sub elements and the particular sub lists that were mentioned are still accessible and available and are used for decision making. So Mr. Chairman, this concludes FEA's presentation and we stand ready to answer any other questions. And again, we wanna thank, thank the committee for the opportunity to present today. Members, any further questions? Further questions for Mr. Edwards, Mr. Small? Okay, uh, Troy, any of the final comments or thoughts? Mr. Chairman, thank you for your audience today. And uh, we look forward to coming back with you, uh, to you to uh, take in consideration the things that have been requested and report back and uh, get further direction from you as a committee. So thank you. All right, any further questions, committee? Okay, with that, it's uh, it's lunchtime on our agenda, so I think we'll take lunch. Uh, do we need a full out? Senator Bevout. Yeah, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we break for lunch, I just had a, a couple of things. One is that uh, talking about experience levels in on this committee, I failed to mention the post-secondary experience of the Senator Office and Senator Landon. But more importantly, that uh, Senator Koss has 47 years in K through 12. And uh, so thank you for, for that long length of service, Senator Koss. The question I have, Mr. Chairman, I'm not gonna be available this afternoon. I've got other commitments, but I'm, many of you of me have seen the letter from the, the governor on his proposed reductions to the school facilities budget, construction budget. And are you going to discuss those? Uh, or is that something that's uh, maybe, I'm sure all of you are aware of what happened and where we are. Is that on your agenda, Mr. Chairman, or or not? Or what, what's your status? What's your thoughts on that? My plan was to visit about that this afternoon. Yes, sir. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, unfortunately, I won't be there, but, uh, you know, getting back to what Senator Landon said, you know, we try to stick together, select committee, what we recommend. And of course, I understand the situation with revenues and uh, two questions I would have, uh, and maybe you can, you can answer them and, and I'll get back and hear from everybody. But one is, I think it's unprecedented that the, the governor would step in and after the bill has been signed and, and make these kind of changes to a capital construction budget. Uh, not sure about that. I'm sure that he has probably the statutory authority to do it. And then, of course, uh, just a matter of personal privilege, one of the ones that was cut or at least has been postponed, and I think that's a big question. Postponement is a lot different than being removed, was the auditorium in Riverton and, of course, the situation up there in Tensleep that I think we've waited long enough. But, you know, it's, it's a matter of picking and choosing, and that gets to be very delicate. So, yeah, Mr. Chairman, good luck on that discussion, and I'll be glad right at the maybe get back with you or Senator Landon later tonight and see how we come up with and what we decide to do as we move ahead. But uh, certainly uh, if we're gonna postpone it, that's one thing, but if it was a matter of eliminating those two, I would I would be very opposed to that and, and would not wanna see us do that. Thank you. Senator Weebout, we'll get back to you with, with that and- uh... Mr. Chairman. Senator Rothfuss. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to follow up on that. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, I appreciate what Senator Bebout's saying. And I, I do think that this committee needs to stick together and make sure that that those two projects that we we committed to last year uh, get finished. And, and I don't know whether they end up getting finished this year or not, but, but I'll certainly continue to support both of those projects since they were the work product of this select committee. Uh, we understood the need for those two projects. And and, uh, you know, I think it's appropriate for all of us to stick to those original positions that we were taking last year and, and do our best to keep those funded. So, Senator Bebot, you know, you, you've got my commitment to, to continue with those projects. Uh, Co-Chairman Landon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. It's time for lunch, but I, I did want to uh, put in with Senator Bebout and uh, assuring that we'll have a conversation. It, it kind of feels like to me, having served on the committee that you now chair, uh, Senator Bebout, and, and our chairman is on appropriations. It just feels like, uh, at the very least, we should, as a select committee, consider making a recommendation to our appropriations committee. And and so, uh, you know, I, I think it'll be a good conversation this afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Anything more before we take a lunch? A quick poll of the committee, is a half hour long enough for lunch? Do you want 45 minutes, an hour? Uh, should we come back at one or one fifteen? Give me some hand signs I'd on the camera. I'd say 115. 115? All right, 115 it is. So we will, adjourn, or we will uh, take a quick break and be back at 115 after lunch. Thanks everybody, thank you to uh, the folks from FEA and and uh, David and 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 Scott for your presentations this morning certainly appreciate them and thanks for your patience and being on the line all morning. Appreciate the opportunity. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, we'll be back you, at one fifteen.